Hey everybody, it's JJ and we're back again for another Asus PC DIY Hardware live stream. So hopefully everybody is having a good Friday, uh, staying positive and productive, uh, winding down the week, whatever it might be. Uh, hopefully you guys have uh, enjoyed your week. We're back again for another Asus PC DIY Hardware live stream. So uh, we've got quite a number of different things to jump into this week. It's been pretty busy in terms of actually product launches. So if you guys, of course, part of our Asus PC DIY group, you guys know about, of course, all of the latest and greatest announcements when it comes to brand new hardware that we like to touch on here in terms of the stream. Uh, uh, but for those of you that are just joining us just for today, uh, let's go ahead and see what we actually have for this stream today. So uh, we have now finally uh, getting ready for the release of the Ryujin 3, which is our latest generation flagship series AIO cooler. So we're going to first be launching with the Noctua IPPC based fan variant as opposed to the white or the ARGB version. Those will be coming in the not too distant future, but we're going to be launching these two models first. We've got some new VA series monitors, the EHF series, uh, which are definitely going to be for those of you on know, a more limited budget, but definitely offer I think a good foundation for those that are looking to get into a gaming centric monitor uh, higher than standard refresh rate nice clean minimal uh, design we've got two really cool uh, tough gaming monitors uh, that are all about ultra high refresh rate gaming and again I think a great choice for those of you that might be on a little bit more of a limited budget but still don't want to compromise on a long three-year warranty, a good sRGB color gamut coverage, um, as well as, like I said, some really nice specifications, whether we're talking about the target refresh rates, uh, response, uh, or of course the resolution support. So we'll be talking about those. And we have two different models with the 1080p version and then a 1440p version. Uh, we've also got a cool update with the XT4 Plus, which I think is gonna be a great option for those of you that are just looking for a strong, high-performant, 
broad reaching Wi-Fi based solution at a very reasonable price point. It's part of our Zen Wi-Fi series, so we'll be touching on that. And then I know that uh, a few of you that have been waiting on the LC series, so we're finally getting ready to release our um, RTX 4090 Strix LC series model, so we'll be touching on that guy. And then of course the rollout for the dual Radeon RX 7600 OC. I've also got some UEFI BIOS updates that I'm gonna be talking about and some promotions, and then a couple of other things that we'll be throwing in to wrap out the stream. So uh, let's go ahead and see who we have joining us for the stream today. Let's see, we've got uh, Erica joining us. Uh, happy Friday, fantastic. Thanks for letting us know that the audio is uh, sounding good. We've got Mike joining us, man, fantastic. Thanks for joining us here on the stream. Uh, the one, the only, the Canadian Grandmaster himself, Sneff Computer Design. If you guys are not following him on his social channels, make sure to go ahead and check him out. Um, uh, wow, big props, man. Thanks, uh, Turbo, for those really kind words. Asus rules, I would be buying Asus motherboards for the next 15 years. Uh, that's a very, very nice sentiment. Thank you so much, right? Um, VTK is asking is JJ tell us something about the Ryujin water blocks for custom loops so I'll touch on that that's actually just a little bit of a kind of concept or prototype design that we did show off at Computex um, but that is something that we're actually uh, kind of evaluating and we know that there's some interest regards so you may uh, you may see it, you may not see it, but we're definitely collecting some feedback, and I'll probably touch on that once we finish covering on the actual Ryujins that we are going to be launching for sure. Okay, so, um, hey Brian, uh, we don't generally talk about anything when it comes to the RG Ally, is the RG Ally is part of our system related pr uh, product line, uh, so that would include things like our uh, laptops, our gaming desktops, um, our phones, uh, of course the ROG Ally, things along those lines, because those are essentially all finished products. On the PC DIY stream, we'd like to focus on all of our PC DIY or system related components, but happy to have you here. And if you have any questions, feel free to go ahead and ask them. Uh, I'm pretty knowledgeable still when it comes to the RG Ally, even though it's not part of what we refer to as our component business group, as opposed to our system business group, but happy to have you here, man. Fantastic. Uh, David, uh, thanks for joining us. Vitor, thanks for joining us. And Michael, uh, also for joining us as well. So pretty sweet. All right, guys, let's get ready to go ahead and kick things off. Um, I've got some new UEFI BIOS updates. So let's go ahead and get into those first. Let me bring up my notes here on the actual models that we have. Uh, there's actually a decent amount of uh, UEFI updates. So let me go ahead and bring these up here. So let's see what we've got going on. Okay. <clears throat> um, I think these are going to be predominantly centered around... Uh, X570, AM4, X470, B450. Okay, yeah. So it looks like the first round is, I think, going to be a follow up release that we had already um, in a series of releases that I think I talked a couple of streams ago about, which essentially was a new uh, new Agisa release from AMD. Uh, this Agisa essentially is just helping to uh, enhance essentially security um, aspects in terms of the UEFI. At this point, essentially, these UEFI builds would be referred to as fully mature. So that means that uh, you don't need to worry about kind of updating this to just be able to have good stability, interoperability, and compatibility as uh, these boards, of course, have been on the market for literally years. So generally, when you see these later UEFI releases, they're usually targeted specifically for either maybe a new component uh, to either be able to improve or enable um, the actual interoperability compatibility of it, or it could be specifically maybe as a security enhancement. Uh, there could be a mitigation implementation issued by the actual CPU manufacturers such as Intel or AMD, and those updates kind of come into play. So uh, let's go ahead and take a look at this respective model. Um, so you can see right here, we've gone ahead and pulled up the Crosshair. This is the X470 version, not even the X570 version, but it did get the UEFI release. And you'll see that the actual release is going to be 1.2.0.a. Um, so that will be your new UEFI. Now do keep in mind that again, if your system is running stable, reliable, you don't have any issues, I don't generally recommend you jump onto this unless you specifically want to have just that latest Agisa in place. Part of the reason being is that if you're jumping from one much, much older version to a much newer version, there can also be other changes in terms of memory microcode support, um, auto roll parameters, and different aspects that can actually change the fundamental kind of stability of your system, especially if you're running overclocked. Now, if you're going to go back and manually retune your overclock specific to the new uh, code base that's going to be in that new AGISA, you should be fine. Uh, but uh, that is something that sometimes users kind of just assume as they think, oh, I can just roll over my settings from this uh, build to the other build, and that's not actually going to be the case. Uh, sometimes if you're following pretty close to stock related parameters, you can generally update without usually any kind of concerns, but many users are at least running probably some form of overclocking when it even comes to their memory, which would be things like DOCP, take for instance, or maybe you're running some form of PBO and customized power profiles, or maybe you're doing RAID. Even RAID, 
there can be things like option ROMs that can be updated that can be affected by the UEFI releases. So do be mindful of that when you go about updating those UEFI builds, okay? So that is going to be for AM4 boards. Um, let me see right here as far as the boards. I'll go ahead and see if I can drop this in the chat for the models here, but we do have actually quite a number of models. Um, I can actually show you here right here. So um, Crosshair X470, the Wi-Fi and the standard, the X470-I, uh, B450-E, F, I, and F gaming version 2. Uh, and then we've also got some actually Intel-based updates. And so for these Intel-based updates, similarly, let me go ahead and bring it up for this model. These are also going to be for, I believe, security mitigation enhancement. There is also some additional fine tuning that we've done to DRAM divider support. But again, uh, Z690 and even Z790 right now are both very, what I refer to as uh, feature, function, and performance mature. That means that uh, the UEFI releases that we've already had for some time are quite solid. So there's not a reason for you to just uh, kind of update for no reason. Uh, but if you do want to be able to go ahead and maybe see if you can have a little bit more improvement, uh, if maybe you're coming from a build I'd probably say more than six months ago, then there could be some reason in terms of maybe updating to this newer build to see if maybe you get a little bit more uh, tuning margin that you might have maybe in terms of DDR5 scaling support um, or maybe certain DIM configurations. So there is some kind of tuning that we've done in terms of microcode. So again, all you need to do is go to the corresponding models. Uh, here, this is for the Maximus Z690 and you'll see it's the 2400 series release and uh, you just go through the standard updating. So again, you can update the UEFI via USB BIOS flashback. You can update it in Windows via uh, AI Suite um, or you can of course use the traditional option which is going inside of the Easy Flash menu interface and flashing within there. So a lot of different ways to be able to ultimately update the board. Um, do keep in mind that in some cases you may also need to update your MEI firmware. So that is very important. So you're gonna notice here the BIOS. Some users forget about the MEI firmware Generally, when there is a new UEFI release, there can also be a new UE, uh, excuse me, MEI firmware, and you do need to update that MEI firmware ideally. So you want to update the UEFI BIOS, the MEI firmware, and then you also want to update the MEI driver. Okay, so uh, just some updates there. In terms of the boards that see that update, um, I believe that has already started to roll out, but um, that is going to be for Z690 Extreme, uh, both the Glacial and the Standard, the Formula, the Hero, uh, the Apex, um, and then uh, B760 series. And then also on the Z790 side, that is also going to be for the Extreme, the Hero, the Apex, the E, the F, the A, uh, the I, the H, the Creator, and then uh, B760 as well, which we just launched the updated version of the B760 creator board, both the DDR5 and the DDR4 version. So um, that ultimately gets you covered there, okay? So um, let me quickly see if we have in there. Um, Chris Rivera has, is the ROG Extreme MOBA the top of line for ASUS? I'm confused. Um, so that's a good question. Um, I've actually covered this. If you check out on the YouTube channel, I have dedicated streams on actually each one of our series. So our ROG Maximus series, our ROG Strix series, our Tough Gaming series, our Prime series. So the way that we kind of break things down is that the Maximus series, uh, which would comprise of boards like the Formula, the Apex, the Extreme, the Hero, um, those are all going to be our flagship series motherboards. Now, we don't necessarily say the Extreme is quote-unquote better than the Hero because they're both really kind of the highest-end versions of the boards that we make. And it's more so that the features and functions in the spec on the Extreme are aligned for kind of a, the highest end or the most kind of demanding user. An example could be that that board comes included with 10 gigabit networking, right? Um, now, the Hero... Here is going to offer still extremely high performing VRM design, really outstanding thermal management, an ESS Saber DAC, premium design, aesthetic points, and many, many, many other elements that really elevate it across all of our other boards in terms of our lineup. But it won't have something like 10G. But again, if you're not somebody that has a 10G network, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's uh, I would say better. It's just segmentationally we've put in spec that benefits a certain type of user. Another thing could be like front Thunderbolt connectivity. There's very, very few chassis on the market that even support dual USB-C on the front of their chassis, and the Extreme does. Um, it also comes with specialized things like what is called the DIM.2 add-in card, which allows for easier kind of M.2 installation. It has a dual um, BIOS design, which allows you to have two different BIOSes that you can run. It has a special Voltition add-in card. There's a lot of specialized accessories. 
case. Um, I'd recommend checking out the stream that I have that actually compares each one of the boards so you can see the difference between like the hero and between uh, the extreme if you're kind of going back and forth. But the extreme has actually been um, now moved out of production. It is no longer available. So unless you find new old stock somewhere, right now for our Z790 series, our flagship model is going to be the Maximus Z790 Hero. Okay, so if you want the highest end board that we currently offer relatively, that is probably going to be the ROG Maximus Hero, although I would also say the uh, Z790 Creator Board is also going to offer some very high-end specifications as well, and that's another option that we have. But those are kind of like our two um, highest-end spec uh, boards, okay? So hopefully that gives you a little bit of a better understanding there, okay? Uh, hey, Liquify Modman, fantastic to have you here on the stream. Thanks so much for joining us. Um, hey, uh, MUFC14, fantastic to have you here. Um, Nelson Lopez is asking, uh, hello from Florida. Are you guys thinking about making the Hyperion on white? Yes, um, and actually I did already, um, I believe, show that off in the Asus PC DIY group. So if you're not part of our group, you definitely want to join it um, and you'll find out about kind of all the latest and greatest updates that I have there. But I did do go ahead and do a post there. Let me see if I can quickly bring up the image uh, for it here and I can show you actually what it looks like. Um, but it's beautiful. I mean, it's it's pretty much just the white version of the Hyperion. The cool thing is that we did do kind of a similar design trend of what we did with the GT502, which means that um, we really kind of went to town when it comes to the white uh, design aesthetic. So we did white interior cables, really soft, nice, great accents for things like the cable, uh, the cable routing points, so your grommets that you have inside of the chassis. Um, and so it looks really, really nice. Yeah, here you can see right here, uh, here's the kind of the concept production model that we showed off at Computex. You can see it with the Ryu Gen 3 in white, and as well as our ROG Strix uh, graphics card, which is also in white. Even things like the integrated light panel is also done in white. Uh, really nice. Now, right now, we don't have a uh, time frame that we are committing to kind of release this, um, but right now, I would probably estimate maybe sometime in Q3, you can probably expect more information regarding the ROG Hyperion in white, okay? Uh, somebody notes a beautiful case if I didn't already have the Helios yeah the Helios is great um, and for the vast majority of people people I think the Helios is the more balanced kind of option I mean the Helios is already a much larger chassis than kind of a standard chassis and you can already support dual 360 millimeter radiator configurations the Hyperion is kind of even a bigger chassis in that respect where it's designed for up to dual 420 millimeter radiator configurations so it's definitely not kind of your general type of chassis right but for us it's just kind of helping to flesh out the different types of options that we have available within our chassis lineup. So we've got everything from kind of more entry level solutions and very mid compact chassis like the GT301. And we're going to actually have a very exciting update to the GT entry level GT series chassis with the GT302. It's maybe the chassis that I'm most personally excited about that we still have, although the upcoming Pro Art chassis, I think I'm actually pretty excited about too, um, to, you know, models like our split chamber design with the GT502 to then things like the Hyperion. All right, guys. Um, with that, though, we uh, went ahead and touched on the UEFI BIOS updates. I will have a full post in the ASUS PCDIOA group that notes all the different motherboards that have the update for this week. And I also think for last week, because last week I had a little bit of partial time off, so I didn't note uh, essentially a UEFI BIOS release. So altogether, that'll, it'll probably be maybe something about like 25 motherboards. Again, uh, most of them are going to be for AM4 and for recent uh, Socket 1700, so things like Z690 and Z790 motherboards. But again, none of these, I would say, are going to be super critical. Um, now, for some of the people joining us in the stream, um, I'm just going to go ahead and take a couple of minutes here quickly, guys. Some of you may already be aware of this, but I want to go ahead and retouch on it because, again, I've seen consistent posts coming up again in the group uh, regarding this topic. So I just want to have another video that covers this, even though I have uh, multiple videos where I do detail this. Um, and it comes about understanding how memory works, especially within DDR5. And when you talk about DRAM scaling, we get a lot of people that ask questions about running um, like two DIMMs or running four DIMMs and why can't I run X different speeds at um, one configuration versus the other configuration. And the important thing to keep in mind is, is that ultimately this comes down to the way that the memory controller works and rank density and population all affect your scaling with your memory. So um, there is a, a table that uh, I'm going to show you right here. This is what we call the Intel Poor table. 
Um, many of you that probably are part of the group or joined the streams in the past are familiar with this, but this table actually helps you to kind of understand that there's a fundamental difference in terms of how the memory controller, so that's the part that's inside the CPU, works in coordination with your system memory. So you can see right here that um, when we're talking about the fastest speeds, now this is um, this is the port table for 12th gen um, as opposed for 13th gen. 13th gen, the numbers go up a little bit, but the fundamental kind of uh, lesson here or kind of the feedback that I'm trying to provide is fundamentally the same even though the numbers go up a little bit. The numbers take for instance on the current platform instead of 4800 they would be 5600 right. Uh, but we can see when we're talking about one slot per channel, one DIMM per channel and single rank memory, single rank memory would generally be 16 or 32 gigabyte memory kits is going to be able to operate at 4800 MT. Now you can see though if you start to increase the memory rank so let's say the user installed something like 64 gigabyte DIMMs right um, so they wanted to go with dual rank memory and either two DIMMs of dual rank or they wanted to go with four DIMMs in dual rank, uh, which is where you can start to see right here where you have the two R configurations and then things like two slots per channel, two DIMMs per channel, you can see that the official memory speed actually goes down. It's not the same. Some people think that the memory controller speed actually stays consistently the same. That's not the case. And this is not just true for DDR5. Um, this was also true for DDR4 and for other uh, for other um, DDR specifications in the past. The only difference is DDR5's scaling is so much better than every other memory standard that we've ever had that the difference between the baseline to the higher speeds is much greater than we've ever seen. Um, so we're really able to go to much, much faster speeds. I mean, consider that right here when DDR5 launched, it launched at 4800 and you can literally right now go buy an 8000 MT kit. There's never been in the history of DDR memory like that, being able to literally have memory that's almost twice the overall effective bandwidth, right? Um, in such a short time cycle and be able to be possible. But at the same time, that is overclocking and overclocking isn't guaranteed. So the big thing that you kind of just have to understand is that as you increase the slots per channel, dims per channel and the rank, your scaling goes down. Um, the overall relative averages, if we're talking about 12th gen, 12th gen, most CPUs, I didn't say all, I said most, and that's important to understand, most CPUs will generally be able to hit a 6,000 MT memory divider in single rank configurations without issues. Um, many CPUs will actually be able to even do better than that, 62, 64, even 6,600 MT is possible. 13th gen um, becomes even more impressive. 13th gen, the majority of CPUs can hit upwards of 7,000 or even greater MT, so they even have a higher performing memory controller, and that does translate if you go ahead and move over um, the 13th gen series CPU to uh, Z690. So instead of maybe running 13th gen on Z790, Z790 has a little bit better memory scaling. So generation, generation, it usually sees maybe an uplift of about um, about 400 to maybe more than that, 400 megahertz um, in terms of kind of uh, clock to clock, right? So if maybe you're maxing out around like 7,000 on similar like on Z790, you could maybe see 70, 7,400 or 7,600. Um, again, there's some variance here in terms of the CPU itself, which you have no way to control. Every CPU is going to have a little bit of difference in terms of the memory controller. Some are going to be outstanding, some are going to be right in the middle, and some actually might not even be that great in terms of how much the effective margin is that they're going to have over the guaranteed uh, frequency that is going to be supported. And that's um, something that I also did a post about in the group. If you guys are interested in this, I actually did post about this um, in the PCDIY group that um, some people are not aware that there are some kits here. Let me see if I actually have a stick. Uh, let me see if I have the image here. I think I might have it here. Uh, yeah, so I did a post uh, regarding actually these memory modules from our friends over at Crucial. Um, there are some actually memory kits that are on the market that are not actually XMP and they're not AMP. They're not uh, they're not some specialized profile. They actually run at the native um, SPD and JDEC values that are defined for that platform. So an example is this memory kit on an AMD platform will actually natively run at 5200 MT C42 at 1.1 volts. That means it's a true plug and play kit for the user. There's literally nothing that you have to do. If you take a 6000 MT Expo kit of memory, it doesn't actually work that way. You literally have to go into the UBFI to engage it to run at its faster speed. If not, it'll actually be running under the AMD default to 5200. Uh, whereas this kit, if you install it, it literally is a true plug and play. It'll run exactly to the rated specifications of the platform. Similarly, this kit 
also a run to the rated specifications of Z790 with a 13th gen series CPU. There's literally nothing that you do. You just put it in and it will run default at 5600 MT. So for some users that just want a true plug and play simplified experience and they don't want to run to any variability, these are great options. And I have a post that, like I said, outlines not only these modules from our friends over at Crucial, there are a couple of other manufacturers that do produce some similar kits like this that they are essentially not, uh, they're not, they do not require you to go in and manually tune any parameters. Essentially, it will just work straight out of the box and they will run that kind of nominal operating value. Um, now, the preference as far as how you want to run your system, that's up to you. This is PCDIY. So um, we're not here to tell you whether or not you should run an overclock situation or whether you should not run an overclock situation. That's your preference. Some people, they're going to be like, hey, I want to try to run the fastest memory that I can. But you have to keep in mind that if you're going to try to run that fastest memory you can, you may run into a wall. And that wall could be defined for multiple factors, whether it's your configuration, uh, whether it's your knowledge on how to tune certain parameters because you've maybe broken the profile by mixing memory kits. Um, there could be multiple things you have to kind of keep in mind. But we have a much lengthier post that's in the PCDIY group that's called DDR5 Insights. And I also have a dedicated live stream that we did with our friends over at Kingston and Crucial that talk about understanding DDR5 memory. And there's also a DDR5 tips and tricks uh, live stream that I did that kind of gives you some insights on how to actually test your DRAM scaling, different values that you can tune, um, what you can do if you run into an issue where you're kind of close to the rated speed, but you know, you can't get there and it's not stable and how you can maybe kind of find a happy intermediate ground and then maybe make up for that and, and maybe adjusting some timings or some other factors. So hopefully that helps a few of you out there that might have some questions and hopefully I can uh, point some people to this in the stream as well. All right. Uh, um, Auntie Fa says, got to like that they call them modules that are plug and play pro. Uh, yeah, I think that's just more that they call them pro because they have actually two different modules. One um, is a really nice, clean looking black module that has, um, I, I don't know if I have them over here, um, but uh, they're just an all black PCB, um, but no heat sinks. And the Pro has the heat sinks, but they're also rated for a little bit faster speed. So that's kind of the main differential, but they have two versions. Essentially, you can get the non-Pro, uh, which are a little bit cheaper and essentially just don't have the heat sinks, or you can get the ones that look a little bit nicer with the heat sinks. Um, but again, you're running at very low nominal DRAM voltages. That's another thing that a lot of people don't kind of keep in mind is that when you buy overclock memory, the DRAM voltage is generally higher. Um, it could be, you know, 1.3, 1.35, 1.4 plus volts. And so when you're having that memory run at faster speeds um, and requiring higher voltages, it does actually produce more heat. And so that's part of the reason why you have a heat spreader. Uh, when you run the memory nominally, essentially at its basic values, it doesn't, it doesn't really uh, factor in in terms of you having to have a heat spreader. So it's not really a factor. That's the reason why nominally you see more of those entry level kits like that. Um, hey, Guillermo, I'm not sure what you're talking about in terms of your issue. Uh, if you have an issue, feel free to go ahead and reach out to our service and support team. You can also post in the uh, Armory Crate uh, forum. But uh, device tab, I can show you actually this system right here. It's working entirely fine along with my six other demo systems. In most situations, usually if you run into an issue, um, it's probably maybe from an update. I know we just released right now a new update that just came out. So you may have to do what's called a cold power cycle. So cold power cycle just means that shut down your system. Um, go ahead and disconnect the power. Wait. Uh, about two minutes, uh, then reconnect the power and then power back on and then um, reinitialize and then go ahead and see if your device repopulates. Uh, usually that uh, just kind of can occur because there's sometimes there's kind of inconsistency of maybe the controller being initialized during kind of the reboot cycle. You have to remember kind of Windows because it doesn't really go through a normal shutdown process anymore. Everything is kind of in this modern standby era. This occasionally can sometimes cause a little bit of inconsistency with the way some devices are initialized between subsequent reboots. But try a cold power cycle um, and you go from there. But I can tell you right now on my current testing and from our collective beta group, um, all active chipsets are all working with all components. Okay. Uh, Lille Chevelle is asking about the PG42UQ. Um, I'm not sure what you mean by not working. Uh, if you have an issue, reach out to our services support team. Um, I know multiple users that are running the monitor without any issues. Uh, we do have a forthcoming HDR improvement firmware, but that doesn't mean that the product doesn't work. It just means that we're enhancing essentially its HDR uh, rendering performance. So we'll have that firmware probably issued by the about the end of this month. It could be a little bit earlier than that, maybe in the next week or two, but otherwise um, I wouldn't worry about it too much.
uh, you should see it uh, come out, like I said, um, and once we do release it, we'll post it in the PC DIY group or, or you can also be potentially follow our social media channels or just randomly check the product page. And once it's issued there, you can just go ahead and download the firmware update and you would be good to go. But again, that's only applicable if you're running HDR on that monitor. If you're running an SDR, uh, you won't really see any differential between the two. Okay. All right, uh, one more question before we go into the next option right here. I have a question. I've got the ROG C790 Hero. If I populate all five slots, including the Hyper M.2 card with Gen 4 M.2 SSDs, will the GPU slot go to eight? Which slot should I? Um, one, there's no by 18, so I'm assuming you mean by 16, and which slot should I avoid to maintain full by 16? It doesn't matter. Um, a lot of users get stuck on this whole needing to maintain full bandwidth. It's irrelevant. The reality is that the uh, GPUs that exist right now in the market don't fully saturate the PC. PCI Express bus. So you could have a 4080, you could have a 4090, a 6950 XT, a 7900 XTX, it won't matter. You can run it at by 8 or you can run it at by 16 and the effective performance is effectively the same. Uh, the margin of difference is probably within a percentage or two. Uh, in our internal testing, it was only in some very extreme cases and again we're talking about like about a 5 FPS difference in terms of measurement for like ultra high refresh rate gaming. So we're talking about our monitors like our 360 hertz or our testing for our upcoming 100, 540 hertz space monitor where you can even see a difference. Um, but otherwise, effectively, the experience is exactly the same. There's no difference between you running it at by four, excuse me, by eight versus by 16. So uh, you don't have to be worried about that. And the other reality is, is that this is the reality of a of utilizing M.2. I'm not actually the biggest fan of M.2. I like U.2 a lot more because you can have much higher densities, so you don't have to have as many drives. But a lot of people just like the simplicity of simple M.2 drives. The more they populate, though, you have to use PCI Express lanes, and there's only so many PCI Express lanes. So eventually you will get to a point that you have to share the lanes. That is why they make higher end platforms uh, where you have kind of HEDT type platforms that are available for both Intel and AMD. Uh, but right now for the mainstream, um, you know, you can really run multiple drives and like I said, not have any issues or concerns. And also keep in mind that your drives, even that you're utilizing, the effective bandwidth that you're utilizing is actually very low. In most situations outside of you running some synthetic test in crystal, crystal, uh, excuse me, crystal disk benchmark or something like that, or Addo, um, which they show you a big old number, which is great when you want to validate just that the drive's working correctly. It's not really relevant to your real world usage. If you actually check real world usage, if you talk about game loading, application loading performance, the experience uh, most of the time in terms of the bandwidth that's being utilized is actually well under SATA speeds. It's part of the reason why that for general like game and desktop application usage, you don't really see that much difference between like a Gen 3 to Gen 4 to even now the newest, latest generation Gen 5 drives. Now there can be definitely scenarios where you do benefit from more bandwidth. If you're especially making very large copies, uh, you have a large kind of specialized workloads that are really kind of pulling the drive. Um, and also probably differences in terms of how the drive performs as it fills up, those can be kind of greater differences. But overall, I would not worry about your kind of configuration of worrying, hey, do I have to maintain by 16 versus it operating by eight configuration, okay? All right. Uh, David goes, put U.2 on all your boards. Uh, we actually did put U.2 on quite a number of boards, but the reality is that users didn't prioritize um, it as a specification and they didn't push manufacturers to say make more U.2 drives. The vast majority of U.2 drives, um, they're made right now for the business and the enterprise segment and you can definitely get them. In my personal system, I run a U.2 drive because I'd rather have one big 20 terabyte drive than have to have like four M.2 drives and take up more PCI Express lanes um, and then even have more kind of issues where I got to take off thermal pads and put heat sinks. U.2, I don't have to deal with any of that. It's a far simpler, more streamlined uh, experience, but of course it was designed specifically for desktops. M.2 was never designed for desktops. It was designed for laptop-based interfaces. So you're dealing with the Z-height constraints, the power constraints, the thermal constraints. It's a great, very performant related uh, specification. Uh, works really well for, I think, laptops and can work pretty well for desktops, but there are specific limitations. Um, but if you really do want U.2 and your motherboard doesn't have it, it's not difficult. You can get a uh, U.2 PCIe add-in adapter. They're low cost, they're less than $20. You can slot it into a PCIe slot. That's what I do on a lot of my motherboards. Uh, just get a U.2 adapter, slot it into a slot, bam, get my U.2 drive, slide it in there, no cables, no nothing, and I've got a high performance, large uh, U.2 based uh, drive, or U.3. Uh, there's both U.2 and now there's U.3, so it doesn't matter, they're both the same. All right. Um, 
um, overall, that covers that, guys. Let's let's go ahead and keep things uh, going along. I already kind of went a little bit off there. We're talking about the DDR5. So let's go ahead and <clears throat> go into our next piece right here. So um, let me see here. I got some quick partner news that I want to go ahead and touch on. So let me go ahead and bring this up and we'll get this up. So our friends over at EK, uh, of course, if you're not familiar with EK, they are water cooling manufacturer, a liquid cooling manufacturer. They produce a lot of great components and they work very closely with us on having a high level of interoperability and compatibility with different types of products that we offer. And so one of the cool things that they have gone ahead and uh, prepped is going to be essentially this guy right here. So um, let me go ahead and bring that up. So. Uh, for some of you may be aware that we do have our WS series, so we have our ASUS Prime series, we have our Tough Gaming series, ROG Strix, uh, ROG series, right, and ProArt series, and we also have our WS. And so WS stands for Workstation Series, so that's our workstation models, and they have gone ahead and actually released a model block that is specifically for the uh, W790A space motherboard. So we have released two w 790 base motherboards. Um, one is the Sage, which is the larger, and then we have the Ace, which is the smaller version. Uh, they both support, of course, the latest generation uh, Intel series Xeon CPUs like the W2400 or W3400. But if you're looking for a very performant base monoblock, then you're going to good to go. Um, in terms of kind of the coverage right here, you're talking about, of course, the CPU. And then you're talking about the VRM. So if you take a look at the image, that's what you're talking about right there. So uh, you have that VRM and then you've got the CPU. I actually really love this design. I think it would be fantastic for this type of platform because it would allow it to be very clean, very compact in terms of its overall implementation. And of course here with these CPUs, especially with the high number of threads and all those P cores, um, you know, we can literally see hundreds of watts in terms of thermal dissipation requirement, uh, 250, 350, 400 watts, because you also do even have overclocking support for these. So it's a, a definitely a platform that uh, while you can definitely use high performing thermal based solutions like those from Noctua and for some other companies, um, definitely I think water cooling is a strong option that should be considered for this type of platform in terms of not only maintaining performance, uh, but also keeping the system not only cool, but also quiet. So that is going to be a cool update from our friends over at EK. Uh, Kevin Daly says, love those WS boards. I agree. I think uh, it's a uh, great series. Um, we don't usually talk about them too much, and we haven't refreshed them as frequently as we used to have in the past, where a lot of times uh, we would see kind of normal enthusiast users go with something like a WS board. Um, that was a little bit more common when you saw a lot more people using kind of multiple GPU configurations or a lot of adding cards. And now, you know, there's not that many people that use kind of a high number of adding cards. Creators and professionals still do, which is the reason why we do maintain those series, um, especially for or kind of like I said, those higher end chipsets where you even have more PCI Express lanes. Where on W790, that's one of the really big things. You have a, just a massive number of PCI Express lanes for all kinds of add-in devices, right? Um, so let's go ahead and go one more here. Now, another little cool update that we have is from our friends over at Optimus. So kind of staying in this water cooling theme. If you guys are not aware, uh, Optimus is a a very cool manufacturer in terms of, I mean that literally and figuratively, uh, but a very cool manufacturer of uh, premium water cooling components. And uh, they have now gone ahead and released their brand new signature block Rev2. So this is their updated block. It's actually gone ahead and has a new cold plate plus improved bass mid plate. Um, so further improvements in terms of temperature performance still has that just outstanding, really cool design um, ID language that I think Optimus does that where if you just want something that just looks really premium, really simple, um, but I think refined aesthetic, I absolutely love them. I do use them in one of my personal systems and I'm a big fan of their water cooling hardware. So this is going to be cross compatible with both our ROG Strix and our Tough Gaming cards for this generation as we made the VRM and the PCB topology pretty much the same. Although the RG Strict card, of course, does have some upgrades, but the layout allows for essentially interoperability with essentially these blocks. So if you're looking for essentially the Rev2, uh, you can go ahead and do your pre-orders right now. And I think they're going to be shipping them out within the next uh, couple of weeks. So that is going to be from our friends over at Optimus Water Cooling. Okay. So pretty cool right there. Let me go ahead and drop those two links in there in the chat for you guys. Do I have the price uh, for the Matrix? No, the Matrix, we've already gone ahead and announced it. Uh, when we actually are ready to release it, we will have up pri updated pricing. So we don't, uh, essentially, we can't give you any more information than we've already gone ahead and released it. So uh, nothing in that regard. Uh, 
Uh, William Wiseman saying, hey, rewatching the beginning of the stream for the Z790 Z690 Extremist new BIOS and support. It's actually for both. Um, so uh, depending on the level of UEFI support that you have available, uh, excuse me, that you have already present, um, you may see essentially some improvements within memory. But again, if you're already running stable and reliable, you're not going to see generally any difference. Um, so there won't be any differential in that regard. But if you're kind of actively kind of overclocking, then maybe you could see some improvements. Okay. All right, and uh, then uh, let me go ahead and drop in the one there for uh, NK's monoblock. Okay, very cool. All right, so there we go. All right, next up, uh, let's go ahead and quickly do some two giveaway announcements, and then uh, we'll get into our new items here. All right, so <clears throat> let me see here. Um, do I have... Okay, so I think we have two giveaways right now going on, guys. Give me one second here to bring them up over here. Yep, okay, yep. We got one for our friends over in Canada, and then one is a worldwide giveaway. So everybody can partake. All right, so let's go ahead and take a look here at our first one from our for our friends over in Canada. So if you're interested in actually being able to win one of these guys right now, the brand new PG27 AQDM, which is our RG Swift. It's our flagship OLED gaming monitor and kind of content-centric based gaming, uh, gaming monitor. Uh, it's a fantastic option. We just also released an even a new HDR update, which made even the HDR experience that much better on this model, along with some other items. Uh, all you got to do is go ahead and get it on, on this link right here, and you have the opportunity to actually win it um, so you can see right here uh, entering this contest is easy and fun and you can enter in four different ways so the asus upgrade entry method is visit the asus page then comment below um, tell us one tech you have in your gaming that you would like to benefit from an asus upgrade uh, there's a social post entry there's an oled monitor entry right uh, which denotes a little bit more information we can find out about a review uh, of the monitor right here and then a bonus store entry method right here so ultimately right here this runs until july 7th i'm going to go ahead and drop the link in the chat again this is for our friends over in canada so if you're in the u.s uh, no options for you but keep in mind we did just recently run a u.s based giveaway that included this same monitor so uh, we do try to balance things out and normally we do actually have more contests for our u.s based uh uh, followers than we do for our Canadian friends. So it's always nice to be able to have something that's specifically just for our friends over in Canada. Okay. All right. Next up, uh, we've got another giveaway right here, which is going to be uh, for essentially a kind of a little bit of an update that we have in terms of our router line. Probably most of you are familiar that Asus has really been a leader within Wi-Fi, um, whether it's going to be Wi-Fi 5, Wi-Fi 6, Wi-Fi 6E, or now upcoming with Wi-Fi 7. And one of the big things that we've really been pushing on for multiple years is really our leadership in having uh, what we call an extendable router. Essentially, it's our Asus AI Mesh ecosystem. Uh, there's a lot of specialized functions and features that we built into our routers based in the Asus WRT firmware uh, that then can be at, um, accessed and enabled and managed all through a web-based interface or of course through the mobile app um, to give you a lot of really cool features and functionality and one of the really cool things is being able to easily essentially add other asus routers to be able to extend stabilize and improve the performance of your network um, so this is really a rarity across the industry where literally we have um, right now i think close to maybe 35 models maybe 40 models that essentially have the ability to be an extendable mesh network so uh, you can take one router and then pair that up with another router even pair it with another router um, AI Mesh can actually support um, two, three, four, five routers simultaneously to be able to give you ultra dense, super big coverage zones. So you can go from 2,000 to 3,000 to 4,000 to 5,000, 6,000 uh, square, uh, 6,000 square foot, uh, excuse me, 6,000 uh, square foot coverage. So a very, very large environments if you really wanted to, but even 6,000 square foot probably would only take two high performance units or maybe three mid range units. Just depends on kind of your Wi-Fi environment. But to be able to kind of celebrate essentially the branding that we have right now for the Asus extendable router concept, we've also teamed up with our friends over in the Asus system side, and we're giving away an Asus ZenBook 14 OLED laptop, um, RTAX 
86U Pro. Um, I'm a big fan of this unit. This is uh, one of my best units that we have on the market. Very, very speedy, high performance, has 2.5 gigabit ethernet support as well, which is great if you wanna pair that up with like a laptop or you wanna pair that up with a desktop. Uh, Multi gigabit LAN uh, support, right? Or WAN support, you can run in either configuration. Uh, we also are then giving away here the RTAX 57 unit, 20 units. So 10 units of the AX60, excuse me, 86U, and then 20 units for the AX57. Okay, so that is gonna be running until the 23rd of July. So I'm gonna go ahead and drop that link in the chat. So if you're interested in uh, maybe picking up a router and uh, leveling up your Wi-Fi experience, go ahead and check that out. And if you've got more questions on anything that working, feel free to go ahead and drop them in the chat. You can also check out our stream that I did, I think maybe about a year ago, that talks about upgrading to Wi-Fi 6 and 2.5 gigabit networking. Um, uh, even though we now, of course, have routers that have moved into where you have tri-band, you've got quad-band, Wi-Fi 6E and Wi-Fi 7, it still gives a lot of really good information to understanding the difference between kind of more entry-level routers, mid-range and high-end routers, how bands come into play, um, the reason why you can actually have routers that can be so much more expensive when you talk about the chipset, the ethernet uh, connectivity and the performance and feature set that they offer. So it's a really good stream that kind of dives into a lot of information that can be valuable if you're looking to kind of find out a bit more about networking or maybe upgrade your network, okay? So let me go ahead and quickly see. Uh, AC now finished with the update earlier this week. I'm not sure what you mean, Michael. Uh, if you can clarify your question regarding the update. Uh, the update, we just started issuing it. Um, so this update is predominantly focused actually at enabling um, adaptive color enhancement support. So that's essentially that new feature that we rolled out, which had kind of the adaptive color mapping option and gradient support. And then it also introduces um, anime matrix syncing support. So that's a pretty cool feature. So if you have like um, the motherboards or the headphones or our keyboards, different products that have the anime matrix, they can actually now be synced just in the same way that we have Aura Sync support for colors. You can also do that with the anime matrix. And so that enables syncing. So that's the big part of that update. It also does um, a further enhance an option to essentially cancel or stop essentially uh, updates. But we had already rolled out essentially an option that allowed users to manually induce updates where it's not kind of automatically rolled out. And we also have what's called a tiered rollout option, uh, which we've actually had in place for a number of months already where essentially we only deploy the releases in kind of waves so once we have a first level feedback that um, kind of users are having a positive experience with that update we then roll it out to another set of users and then we roll it out to another set of users and that helps to just ensure more kind of consistent experience and uh, considering our wide ecosystem of users uh, over 30 something to 32 million users or something like that they use armory crate uh, it's important that we kind of manage that release in waves okay Okay, so um, I think that covers that. All right, guys, so let's go ahead and get into some of our new products here. All right, so let's get into it here. So I think first up, uh, we're gonna go ahead and I think get the Ryogens out of the way, pretty straightforward. So let's go ahead and talk about those quickly. So we've got the Ryogen 240 and the Ryogen 360. So these are our latest generation units. Uh, you're gonna see that they're gonna be coming in at 270 essentially and 340. So uh, 240 is gonna be for the 240 millimeter and then for the 360 millimeter based uh, unit, you're gonna have a 340. So um, we're gonna go ahead and just quickly talk about some of the key differences. Keep in mind that these are going to be for the versions that come with the Noctua IPPC based fans. So one of the big uh, kind of updates that we had for the Ryogen 3 was that it does include um, ARGB fans that have a daisy chain and magnetic design, but that is exclusive to the ARGB versions for both the white and for the black. So if you're somebody that doesn't want to maybe have the complexity of having RGB lighting, you prefer the simplicity or you really appreciate the quality and the performance of the Noctua IPPC based fans, these are going to be a fantastic option. Of course, you can replace the fans, but these are really premium fans. So, um, you know, you're probably going to be going down if you replace the fans. So I probably wouldn't uh, swap them out. Um, but of course, you can do that if you want. So uh, let's go ahead and quickly take a look at the models that we do have um, for the Ryogen. So for the models that we will be offering, as I noted right here, right, we're going to have the 240 and then the 360. Both of these come included with the Noctua IPVZ fans. Then we're going to have the 240 
and the 360 with the uh, brand new magnetic daisy chain base fans okay now here the screens are not illuminated but it's the same exact screens so, so all of them still have the exact same screens and all the improvements that we're going to talk about in the screens and then we're going to have the white option which will also be just like the black ones uh, same de uh, daisy chain magnetic fan design everything else that we're going to talk about is identical between the teams so it's pretty much just going to come down to the color and the fans being different between the models okay so let's go in and let's see uh, what's new first. Okay, so what's new? Um, this unit compared to the older generation, right? It's the brand new 8th gen base uh, pump. It has a new larger cold plate, okay? Uh, there's a thicker radiator, so it's, it also takes up a little bit more space. So in most chassis, it shouldn't be an issue, but if you have a very compact chassis, just make sure you need to account for the thicker radiator, 30 millimeters. That does allow for a little bit of improvement in terms of cooling performance. Um, and then the new um, ROG MF12S fans, right, which also have an optimized, like I said, ring barrier design, their daisy chain and their magnetic. But on the Noctua edition, that does, this does not apply. So you can essentially remove these and it's just going to be in the Noctua IPPC based fans. Um, they both have the 3.5 inch display, which now supports 60 frames a second, and it supports essentially faster and smoother animations. Uh, and that's enabled through essentially twice the onboard memory. Um, the VRM assist fan has been enlarged, so it's a larger fan with a ring barrier and it has improved static pressure, uh, aluminum bezel, and it's also available in white. So that's kind of the differences, right? Um, and what's the same? What's the same, okay? And this is, I'm just comparing this to the prior Ryujin 2 for reference, um, still 3.5 inch display. The magnetic pump housing is really nice because you can still take off the housing or you can put on the housing. Dual screen orientation, so you can still go in horizontal or vertical. Um, you can still have pretty much class leading uh, readout display support with single, dual, triple, or quad stat readout. Um, or you can fully customize it by doing stuff unique with an ADA64. Speaking of ADA64, it comes included with the full one-year licensed version of ADA64. To my knowledge, we're the only AIO cooler that does that. If you just buy that by itself, that's 25 bucks. Uh, the VRM cooling design, the botted mountain tubing, six-year warranty, um, and then the 400 millimeter cable length. Okay, so all the way around, that is going to be the Noctua. Uh, base recap. Now let's go ahead and just quickly take a look at some of the design elements here. Okay, so it's that larger cold plate that we talked about. That 400 millimeter tubing, which also of course has that nice sheathing. That big 3.5 inch base display, which like I said now goes up to 60 frames a second for some really nice smooth animation. The botted mounted tubing, which helps to minimize any obstructions that you might have uh, next to the DRAM or anything like that. Um, and here you're going to see a lot of slats in the venting and the venting and the slats there are there because of course there the unit has an integrated VRM assist fan which helps to provide direct airflow to the VRM um, in that surrounding area. Uh, the Noctua fans which of course come included inside the unit. Uh, that radiator like I said 30 millimeter versus 27 millimeter. Okay. And there you can see the VRM assist fan and you can see the little uh, kind of contact pins there because like I said, the top of the housing is magnetic. So you can go ahead and lift it off, easily go ahead and get everything mounted and then pop it back on and you're good to go. And again, you can go in either vertical or a horizontal configuration, okay? So I'm not gonna go through the same images on the 360. The 360 is exactly the same. There's no difference. Um, it's just 360. Um, in terms of the cooling performance, some people go is like, do you really need to go 360? It doesn't actually affect cooling performance that much. Um, on average, you're generally seeing just a couple of degrees of difference between the two. Um, the partial kind of benefit that you get with the 360 is just being able to maintain a little bit co a better cooling performance with a little bit quieter operation because you just have a little bit more displacement, right? Um, but ultimately, it's not going to be massive. Also, keep in mind that cooling performance is heavily defined by your workload, right? So a lot of people will use a synthetic workload, so they'll run like Prime 95, or they'll run OCCT, or they'll run Cinebench, but your temperatures in the real world situation are going to be significantly below that. When you're talking about actually gaming, it doesn't matter what game you run or desktop applications, your temperature performance, it can be sometimes in the range of 20 to 40 degrees cooler than you can have in a synthetic, work st uh, a synthetic stress test. So keep in mind that while you can use your synthetic stress test to create this kind of worst case scenario, I don't even really kind of define that as being a worst case scenario. The only people that really should kind of be evaluating their temperatures from that perspective are one, just validating your equipment, making sure it's correctly, 
or people that are actually using their systems for content creation because in content creation applications you can just see multi-threaded sustained usage so that means you're using essentially all those cores right so as an example if um you ever kind of just want to get a sense of kind of how your system is working um just open up your task manager right just do this open up your task manager, go to your logical processors, and you can start to see like how much of the CPU utilization is working when you're working on your system, when you're gaming, when you're doing different things. And like I said, uh, you'll find for gaming, your usage is gonna be quite a bit lower, right? You can run a synthetic stress test and it'll start to use all these threads, but you're not gonna find any games that utilize that type of heavy, consistent, 100% utilization on the course. Uh, then there's also factors like um, instruction sets. Different applications can use different instruction sets where other applications don't, and that can also affect thermals. But if you really kind of want the best experience right now from an AIO, these units are going to give you the best AIO cooling performance on the market right now. So whether you want to go with a Ryzen series CPU or you want to go with an Intel series CPU, they both come with all the bracking, uh, brackets and the mounting hardware for either one of the platforms. So you can be good to go in that respect. Okay. Uh, let me go ahead and see. How many max seconds will the Ryujin 3 hold? I'm not sure what you mean, Rusty. Um, max seconds, that doesn't make much sense to me. Um, and if you're talking about max seconds, uh, I'm assuming, oops, sorry, I'm assuming that you're probably talking about um, probably like max seconds in relation to peak temperature, right? That's obviously ultimately defined by how you run your system, right? So you could argue well, are you running your system with multi-core enhancement enabled? Are you not running it with multi-core enhancement enabled? Because that makes a big difference in terms of the power, right? That the CPU is utilizing and how it's boosting. Are you overclocking? Do you have a uh, per core configuration? Do you have e-cores disabled? There's so many different variables, right? That you have to account for. Again, um, the way that I look at it, right? is just that you're gonna be able to have essentially an outstanding experience, right? And if you wanna be able to then further kind of increase your clock performance, right? Through overclocking you can easily do that with that and I can give you an example I mean uh, with something like the Ryogen 360 it already be achievable with the Ryogen 2 but you could be seeing a very robust perco overclocking you know where you're talking about you know 6.1 6.2 6.3 uh, gigahertz on some of those lightly threaded applications that are possible with this type of cooling configuration right um, and that's something that you could be running with a nominal non 100% fan curve right but, you know, more specifics, um, we'll probably do a live demo in a setup where we'll actually have a system set up and we'll show you kind of exactly how it runs, just like what we did with the Ryujin 2 uh, and the Ryu, uh, where we have streams uh, where we did on both of those. Uh, but overall, it's going to be very much contingent on how you tune and how you run your system. And uh, I like just from MCE alone, you can have a huge difference in terms of the wattage. So it really does, uh, uh, it really does matter in terms of how you're kind of tuning your system. Um, let me see right here. Uh, William Wiseman is going, I legit love my Ryogen 2. I'm probably buying the new one. Are there any new updates to AC for the customization on display? Um, right now, no immediate new updates. If you have feedback, feel free to go ahead and drop it in the AC forum, which is monitored by our dev team. We are working on our next milestone release. So that would be for like version six. Right now we're still under version 5.6 or something like that. Um, so we may see kind of maybe other updates, but right now there's a lot of things that you can already kind of customize. Like I said, from single to double to triple triple to quad display. Plus you have that full customization that's already available with the Ada 64 where you can have customized kind of UI elements. So beyond that, it then comes in, well, then what else do you want to see? Because most of the other customization would usually be putting in their own kind of images or animations or texts or things along those lines. But if you have specific feedback, feel free to let us know in the AC forum. Um, let me go ahead and just see if there's any other quick questions right there. Where are people buying it from? It hasn't been released yet. Uh, right now, this is just the first announcement of it becoming actually available. So you can't buy it yet. Um, in terms of availability, as I noted right there, the pricing uh, we did note right there. So let me go ahead and bring that back up again. So again, uh, the 240 
going to be coming in at 270 and then the 360 will be coming in at 240 and generally the release uh, to time cycle is usually between about 10 to 30 days so once we kind of deploy it out in terms of channel availability uh, depending on the e-tailer partner whether we're talking about micro center we're talking about the isu store new egg amazon wherever it might be you're usually talking somewhere between about 10 to 30 days so within that time frame you should start to see it pop up uh, and available for purchase okay so hopefully that gets you covered there if anybody has any other questions regarding uh the ryujin feel free to go ahead and let me know and i'll do my best to go ahead and bring those up but if not we'll get ready to go into our next products right there um and again somebody was asking about max turbo constantly again that's where I go back to the point of where I talked about. And, you know, if I really, if we really, really, if we have a lot of people that really, really want to know this, uh, I can go and I can show you what I'm talking about even again here as in a demo, ex uh, uh, an example here on this demo system next to me. But the reality is that max turbo is already defined by Intel, right? And, but max turbo values can be influenced by your power targets, such as if you have MCE versus you don't have MCE, you're going to have actually a different quote unquote max turbo. So when you even say something like max turbo constantly, right? What are you really talking about? Are you talking about with MCE turned off? Are you talking about with not turned on? Right? And then even when you talk about turbo, turbo is how you achieve overclocking, right? Because if you disable turbo, you can't actually have your overclock settings enabled, right? And so when you're talking about max sustain that, does that mean, uh, I don't know, like having all your P cores running at 5.8, which is not the way that the word run. It would be much more conservative than that, right? Because ideally to get the most performance out of CPUs right now, we use a per core with what's called a VF curve, which means that the voltage and the frequency is on a curve, right? And as you go to a lower number of cores, a lower number of threads, the frequencies go up. As you go to a broader number of cores and broader number of threads, right? The frequency is gonna go down, right? So, you know, at the peak, you get to like, let's say, like I said, 6.1, 6.2 on one or two threads or something like that. And then as you go down, you know, maybe you're at, you know, uh, four, six or four, five or whatever, you know, your all core thread is going to be. That depends on the CPU, right? And we've talked about this in our overclocking live stream for both 12th gen and 13th gen series CPUs, where I even actually give you kind of performance demos. I show you actually how to test for that and how you can kind of compare and contrast those metrics. But there's a lot that kind of goes into there. So you can't just kind of generalize saying this scenario versus this scenario, because a lot of it is defined on how you want to define the operating parameters of your system. Okay. Uh, Debarcus is when you say the Ryogen 3 hasn't been released. It hasn't been released at all. None of the models. We've only announced the unit. So none of them have been released. The only model right now we just started releasing to the channel for availability is the ones with the Noctua IPPC based fans. So the ARGB models, we've announced them, but we have not even yet released those. So again, until you see a post in the group or something here, like in the stream, where I specifically call out this type of post, right, which is saying new this week and it has the pricing. It's just something that we've announced, right? It has not actually been released to the channel. But these units, we essentially have received them into inventory and we're now working to distribute them out. So these are the first two units that are available in the Ryogen 3 lineup, okay? All right, hopefully that makes sense there. Um, go ahead and see. <clears throat> Stock of the temps are too high, Max. Um... Christian's asking, when will Asus release a new wireless headset? Uh, we already have quite a number of wireless headsets. So, you know, we, um, especially with the ROG Delta S wireless, which I still think is one of the best headsets you can get on the market if you're talking about wireless, right? It's got Bluetooth support and 2.4 gigahertz support as an integrated beamforming mic. It's actually on promotion right now. I'm going to be talking about it a little bit later in the stream. Um, but right now we have no immediate plans to launch anything new outside of the models that we currently have, which I think uh, are very well specced. So uh, if you're looking for some, take a look at the models we have. We have tough gaming wireless we've got rg strix and then we also have our rg delta series wireless so we do have quite a number of different models right there okay all right guys uh, let's go ahead and get into our next product right here um let's see what we're gonna do we'll do the va monitors uh these will be really quick um it shouldn't take us too long so let's go ahead and just quickly touch on these here so 
I'm going to talk about these two guys right here. So this is going to be the VA24 EHF and the VA27 EHF. You're going to see these are very aggressively priced. So $105 and $130, right? And so um, the V uh, series for a very long time was really kind of like the benchmark for a lot of kind of gamers that were on, let's say, a more limited budget. And they were just looking for kind of a solid entry level monitor to be able to kind of adopt into. Also, before we started having our kind of dedicated uh, gaming line uh, with things like our Tough Gaming series and our ROG series of monitors. Uh, they were kind of known as kind of the quote unquote gaming monitors because that's the first monitors that we had uh, with 120, 20, 120 hertz, 144 hertz refresh rate support. And still even right now, they're quite popular for that. Um, so these monitors, they are focused a little bit more towards, I'd say, just the general user, but they do start to offer some base entry specifications that would even complement, I think, kind of a gamers that are on a uh, limited budget. OK, so let's go ahead and take a look at the VA24. Uh, so the VA24, like I said, uh, coming in about $105, right? It's going to be 24 inches, an IPS-based display, 1920 by 1080, 100 hertz refresh rate, uh, supports adaptive six, adaptive sync, and then it will also support Visa mounting support, a nice thin bezel design, and you're good to go. In terms of the ergonomic adjustment, this is going to support, I believe, only tilt um, adjustment is going to be available to you. So let me go ahead and double check that. Let me see over here. I think it should just be tilt. And in case you're always wondering, that's uh, you can always kind of check that information right there. Um, let's see right here. Yes, I was correct. So yes, tilt support is an option on the monitor. Okay. Um, and then in terms of the connectivity on this one, it is limited to HDMI. So just keep that in mind that it's an HDMI only base monitor. Okay. Um, now, in addition to that, we're also going to have just a little bit bigger version of that same monitor at 27 inches, which again is going to give you the same clean kind of refined bezel design, thin bezel design, 100 hertz operation, IPS based panel, right? Exactly the same D uh, HDMI in terms of the connectivity um, and Visa mount support as well. Now, one thing that uh, commonly gets left out of the conversation, a lot of people do forget, um, especially I think when you're looking at more kind of entry level displays, and this would go even for like our uh, entry level tough game displays, which I'm going to talk about here in a little bit, is, is that we do offer a three-year warranty. There's many other manufacturers for a lot of these lower price monitors, where if you actually check the warranty specification information, it could be one year or maybe two years, as opposed to our three-year limited warranty. So I think that even though you're going with a more um, low-cost option, right, it's nice to know that you're still actually getting a three-year warranty coverage for uh, LCD-based displays, uh, regardless of whether you're talking an entry-level model, a mid-range model, or a higher-end models. Uh, that is applicable for LCD, do keep in mind things like QD, OLED, and OLED based displays have a different warranty policy. Okay. All right. So that gets us covered there for the VA uh, series, uh, the new EHF models. So next, we're going to go ahead and going to talk about this guy, uh, two new tough gaming based monitors. I like both of these. These are going to be cool additions that we're going to have. So we're going to have one that we're going to be about ultra refresh rate gaming at 1080p and then we're going to talk about ultra refresh rate gaming at 1440p so whether you want to go into that 1080p side or you want to go into that 1440p side these two monitors i think are going to be great additions to what we have right now so let's go ahead and check this out first one is going to be the vg 279 q m1 a coming in at 259 okay so let me go ahead and bring this one up right here give me one second here and uh m This should be the M1A, and yep, uh, that's the 1440p. Yep, here we go. Okay, perfect. All right, guys. So this is going to be uh, the VG279Q M1A. This, this is 27 inches, 1080p. Okay, supports up to 280 hertz refresh rate. That's a new fast IPS based display. So you are going to get a one millisecond grade to grade. That's the peak. Of course, if you waited the response time across the display, it's going to be more than one millisecond, but that's the peak. That's the generalized rating that gets utilized. Uh, it does support ELMB sync. If you're not familiar with that, that's what's called backlight strobing. So traditionally, most backlight strobing doesn't support having the ability to run adaptive sync at the same time. Adaptive sync can, of course, provide you a smoother gameplay experience without tearing. The big benefit of wanting to run a backlight strobing implementation like ELMB is going to be for potential improvements to motion clarity. So it's a nice option. You don't have to use it, but if you want to be able to kind of turn something on and see if you get an improvement in terms of your gameplay experience when it comes to motion clarity, it's a nice option that you have available that you can toggle on. 
You do have FreeSync Premium and G-Sync compatibility built in and variable overdrive helps to maintain kind of the consistency of motion clarity performance across the refresh rate range, which is important because at 280, uh, 280 hertz, you might not have a system that can comfortably run every single game sustained at 280 frames a second, right? So you're gonna be going anywhere from let's say, you know, 60 to 90 to 120 to 200 to 240 to 280, right? And so you're gonna be going back and forth. And so it's important to have a tuned variable overdrive experience where that overdrive is getting adjusted throughout there to try to be consistent, mitigate things like overshoot and undershoot, um, and ultimately just give you a good consistent kind of motion clarity experience. Um, I love the fact that it's also 100% sRGB, so you get great color coverage for games, for general desktop usage and applications. You're gonna be go a little bit better than standard SDR brightness performance is also gonna be available on this display here. And it is also going to be uh, featuring um, let me see down here, it's coming over here. Um, our display widget center. If you guys aren't familiar, I've talked about display widget center. It's a great UI software that we have that allows you to, to essentially control elements in Windows. So the great thing is if you want to adjust like your brightness, or your contrast, uh, you want to change from like FPS mode to sRGB mode, you can do that all in Windows. You don't have to physically touch the buttons on the monitor. So it's a much, much easier way to be able to go ahead and take advantage of all the rich options that we have essentially at customizing the monitor experience. Uh, you've got DisplayPort, two HDMI, and then a 3.5 millimeter jack connection. And then on this model, I should believe it's only tilt. Yes, uh, tilt adjustment is gonna be on here. So that all comes in at 259. So I think if somebody you're focusing a lot, like I said, on esports based titles, older titles, games where you're focusing at that 1080p resolution, but you wanna be able to drive that high refresh rate, low latency, right? Um, and this does also feature what we call our game fast, low latency design. So that's gonna be very, very good for input latency. Um, this is gonna be a very solid choice, okay? Uh, now, next up here, we're gonna step it up and we're gonna go into 1440p. This is gonna probably be my go-to monitor that I'm gonna be recommending for a lot of people for the remainder of the year. Uh, it really hits the sweet spot, I think, in terms of a lot of the key specifications. So we go into 27 inches, 1440p, up to 260 hertz, right? This is also gonna be a fast IPS-based display, one millisecond, grade to grade. That's gonna again be peak response time, has the variable overdrive, 100% uh, sRGB. Now notes display HDR 400. This is not an HDR kind of focused monitor. Part of the benefit of having an HDR 400 rating though is I can tell you though that the SDR rendering performance here in terms of brightness will be better than standard. So if you're coming over from a much older monitor, could be your monitor might be maybe only 200 nits, 250 nits. Um, this is going to comfortably be higher than that. And so you'll have a bolder, brighter experience, which is nice in terms of just kind of punch and dynamics. Um, you maintain the same things that we talked about with ELNB Sync. FreeSync Premium and G-Sync compatibility. Uh, this model should also have the display widget software as well that allows you to go ahead and tune everything. Yep. And a little bit more rich ergonomic support that's going to be on this model. So here you're going to have um, the HDMI and the display port, but in terms of the adjustment, you're going to have a bit more. So you're going to have tilt, you're going to have swivel, you're going to have height, and you're gonna have pivot. So you have pretty much the full range of adjustment available to you on this monitor. So um, again, I think a really, really solid choice that we have for those that are gonna be considering a 1440p monitor, which it's really the sweet spot. Uh, I think for the foreseeable future, especially even with higher performing graphics cards, if you haven't made an upgrade, uh, the, even high performing cards can't necessarily take AAA games and run them at this refresh rate at 1440p. So it really gives you a great balance of high resolution, um, really nice motion clarity, low input latency, right? And overall, very, very balanced experience. So definitely check this check this monitor out if you wanna hit the kind of that sweet spot for 1440p. I think both of these options are gonna be really popular amongst gamers for a long time, where that, again, that 1080p model is gonna give you that ultra high refresh rate option, right? And then we've got that 1440p. And of course, we have higher end versions of both of these under the ROG line, which even go to higher, like we've got a 1440p. 360 hertz refresh rate, which actually can even mirror a thousand hertz refresh rate through the new ULMB2 update, um, right? Which is exclusive to that RG Swift monitor. So um, we even have higher end displays, but then of course you get into even much more expensive options. So I think overall for the price points, when you talk about color accuracy, when you talk about the response, when you talk about the overall feature set, these are really, really solid options, all right?
Hey, Warren, I'm not sure what, uh, uh, there's a lot of people that really actually like a lot of the monitor stuff, but if you have a specific kind of item that you want to uh, talk about, feel free to go ahead and let me know and I'll see if I can go ahead and touch on it, all right? Um, Stardust is noting, still waiting for the PG uh, UQXR. Yeah, uh, we'll be keeping it uh, in the not too distant future. You know, make sure to keep it tuned. Of course, when we have any announcements in that respect, we'll definitely be touching and we'll, we'll we'll be talking about it. So don't worry about that. Okay, so um, rounding things out here, guys, that is going to cover our first round of new product updates. So again, uh, we've got the ROG Ryogen three. Uh, with the Noctua IPPC fans, the 240 and the 360, the new VA series monitors, the EHF miles, uh, 24 and 27 inch, and then we've got the VG279QM1A, so essentially that ultra high refresh rate 1080p monitor, and then we just talked about the VG278QML1A, which is going to be the 1440p ultra high refresh rate monitor. All right, so now let's go into maybe I think one of the most interesting models um, that came out of actually Computex that we're now getting ready to release right now. And that is going to be this guy, the ROG Swift PG3AUQ. Um, so um, traditionally, when you wanted to kind of go 4K, you've had to kind of either go with 27 to 28, uh, 28 inch or 32 right and then if you wanted to go bigger than that you'd have to go to like a 42 or 48 inch so we have 42 and we have 48 inch base monitors but for a lot of people those are too big they're just too big to put on a desk there's some people that swear by it and they say that they can use it but for a lot of people they dimensionally just can be too big and so we've actually had a lot of people that have wanted to see kind of like that middle ground and so this is the world's first it's a 38 inch 4K high refresh rate gaming monitor. And so it really hits that nice balance of giving you something that has a significant increase in terms of the desktop space, right? Uh, in terms of immersion and desktop productivity by moving into 38 inches, but dimensionally is still gonna be quite a bit more compact than a 42 or 48 inch display. So you still have a much more kind of traditional actually field of view and even actually the distance ergonomically. If you're not aware, ideally, usually you wanna have about an arm's length fully between where your monitor is at and where your kind of, let's say your chest and your face is at, right? You wanna be able to fully extend your arm and not have your monitor essentially be in that zone or in that space. Uh, if you even have it probably a little bit more than that, it can be well suited, but that's generally the uh, what's called the kind of the optimal uh, middle ground that you wanna have in terms of spacing. And this works really well for the vast majority of people in terms of the desk, um, dimensions that they have so uh, recapping kind of the key specifications we can see 38 inches 4k 144 hertz this is a new um low uh excuse me low response base panel right so compared to some of the earlier kind of larger format panels which had a little bit higher response time here we go with low response time again this is peak grade to gray right so keep in mind the overall average is still higher than that so one millisecond grade to gray outstanding color coverage right 98 percent dcip3 hdmi 2.1 also integrates a USB hub and a threaded mount design. So let's go through some of these cool design points that we have here on this monitor and uh, we'll go through it. So uh, let's go here. So first up, um, it's got a really nice clean kind of stylized design right here where you have these two large angled base stabilizing portions of the stand. So they don't take up a lot of space in the front part of your desk, which is great, but they still give you a really, really stable foundation. I'm a really big fan of that design. and I really like that. Okay, nice thin bezels in terms of the overall design there as well. Uh, when you take a look at the top, the top is very interesting because you actually will see right here that it does have a threaded mount. So with that threaded mount, you can put things like a camera, a light, a microphone. You can even put like one of our portable monitors to have a secondary monitor on top of the monitor if you want to do that. There are some people that do that. Um, this USB port can actually be used to power different types of devices, things like a camera, a microphone, secondary display, different types of accessories. That's what that USB port is right there. You also have that handle, which helps you just in terms of movement or lifting or kind of positioning it because there are people that sometimes they grab monitors from just the top of the bezel and they can crack or damage the bezel or from the sides so having actually kind of a more let's say handling sensitive type design is nice especially when you get to these larger format type monitors okay 
Um, now, when we take a look at the connectivity, you've got HDMI here, you've got HDMI right here, and you can see we've also made them right access. So nice, clean in terms of the accessibility, just routes out there to the side. You've got a cable management routing path right there, display port, and then you have integrated uh, USB high speed connectivity. So that's going to be your in. So you essentially have a two port hub solution that's built in there as well. So that just gives you the flexibility that if you want to maybe attach your wireless adapters or, or different types of accessories, you've got two high speed ports that you do have available to you there. Uh, and then you can see there's that open kind of cutout, right, that is available, okay? And that uh, pretty much covers uh, the most kind of at uh, least immediate points there in terms of the visuals. Um, but we can go ahead and uh, take a look here at uh, just kind of the general product page and go over some of those key elements. So. Um, the HDMI 2.1 is going to be nice, of course, for the latest generation based graphics cards and latest generation consoles. You do have, of course, G-Sync support is going to be here. So G-Sync compatibility along with FreeSync Premium Pro is going to be present on this. Now, this is display HDR 600. But again, I wouldn't rank this as an HDR centric monitor. It is going to definitely allow for a little bit of kind of pop if you did want to put it into HDR mode. Um, because it's not a full array local limiting based display, though, you're not going to necessarily really get that, I think, outstanding performance, especially not only in contrast, uh, but in that superior gradation that you would get with like a mini LED and a full array local dimming. So again, I think the big benefit here is going to be outstanding SDR performance and a very, very bright SDR gaming monitor. So if you really want to be able to have a punchy SDR gaming experience, this is going to be fantastic. And especially with the high color gamut performance, it's great. And something I didn't note on the tough gaming displays, and it's a differentiation between tough gaming and ROG, is going to be ROG monitors do come factory calibrated. So that means from the production facility, they are calibrated outside of the box. And we know from polling, there's a lot of users that don't even calibrate their monitors, that don't even know how to calibrate their monitors. So if you actually care about having accurate color uh, display right out of the box, that's a nice benefit of an ROG uh, Strix, ROG Swift-based displays as they come factory calibrate outside of the box. So if you don't even have a colorimeter, you don't have the equipment, you don't need to worry about that. Although I will tell you, ideally, you do want to kind of maybe calibrate your display every six months or so because you can start to have color drift after a certain period of time. But still, um, it's better than nothing, definitely in terms of having a more consistent and a solid experience when it comes to color rendering where it's calibrated already out of the box. Okay, so um, some other little points right here, just because this is a larger format display, it does also come included with a remote control, which can be nice for just swipping between different types of options. It has higher performing speakers than what you would traditionally find in a standard display. So some monitors, they don't even have any speakers, or they might have like one watt, maybe two watts. This is dual five watts, and there's a little bit of an improved driver that actually has a little bit um, more um, performance in terms of actually how it handles um, the overall kind of uh, the audio path. And that helps to reduce things like distortion. Um, it's nice. I, I'd say it's a solid experience if you want to use it for like web playback, for like podcasts, for basic gaming sessions, uh, music, video on demand, things along those lines. If you just want to relax, you don't want to have to always wear headphones. It's nice to be able to have some nice speakers built in there and you can just watch a stream, watch some gameplay sessions, uh, play some games, right? Just be able to enjoy the audio experience directly built in, especially with that larger format display. It's nice to be able to have that cross level of flexibility and functionality that's there. Now, one other thing that's pretty interesting that we do also have is that this does have adaptive uh, sizing support where you can actually run different aspect ratios. So the aspect ratios control allow you to have kind of some different experience here where you can have pixel perfect uh, options and you can also run different actually dimension options. So you can see right here, you can simulate essentially a 25 inch display, a 27 inch display or a 34 inch display or you can have the pixel perfect modes, right? Which are running at 2528 by 1512 and then 2884 by 1220. And those will also support the high refresh rate um, rendering performance. So you have a lot of flexibility that kind of depending on the game environment, if let's say you get into scenario and you find that the field of view is maybe too big, right? Some FPS players find that maybe playing on something like, um, uh, you know, even a 34, 38 is too big. And so they want to go down to maybe something like 27, right? Or even 25 and have a more focused field of view, then this can actually be a benefit. So you kind of have multiple monitors in a way, right? Where you can actually toggle back and forth between these different values. So that is a pretty nice level of flexibility and functionality that you have there. So that is going to be the PG38UQ. I think a very nice option for those that are going to be looking for a large format 4K gaming monitor. 
Um, Michael knows, I wonder how it compares to an LG OLED. Um, well, I would say if you're trying to compare it to an LG OLED, I would compare our actual OLED. Um, I don't think you compare really OLED to non OLED because OLED is going to offer superior contrast, right? And it can offer an HDR gaming experience. So we have actually our ROG Swift 42 and our ROG Swift 48. And you can already find in actually testing, uh, we do offer a number of benefits compared to um, LG solutions that where we offer superior brightness performance, uh, we have better factory calibration performance. Um, also in our displays here, if you're comparing it to a TV, TVs aren't very good at actually working as a monitor. They don't support um, actually correct resume, uh, resume and sleep and hibernation functionality where a monitor does. And if you actually check on users, a lot of users can be very annoyed by this. So if you want actually want to compare, you know, I'd say a more kind of apples to apples type comparison, I would evaluate something like our 42 or 48 inch OLED solutions to something like a large format TV. Although again, there are gonna be significant differences between a way a TV is designed versus the way a monitor is designed, right? Um, I would say though that an LCD does have some advantages compared to OLED when you talk about things like the consistency of things like the subpixel rendering. It's sharper, it's clearer. You don't have to worry about things like burn-in. Uh, the color gamut performance can actually be even better on an LCD than, a, than on an OLED. Uh, but of course, the, the contrast um, and the self-emissive technology, of course, is really the, the key benefit, along with the pixel response. Pixel response is going to be even faster on an OLED than it would be on an LCD. Right? But again, we have OLED solutions. We have 13-inch OLEDs. We have 15-inch OLEDs. We have 27-inch OLEDs. We have uh, 32 inch OLEDs, we have 42 and 48. So we have a full comprehensive lineup of OLED solutions as well, okay? Uh, Marcus goes, why does Asus not make monitors with VA panels? We do, we actually have lots of monitors with VA panels. Um, so yeah, you can take a look at our website. Um, probably have at least maybe something like 15 monitors with VA panels. So uh, VA is traditionally more common for usually generally ver curved base displays. Um, generally, when you talk about flatter displays, usually more of the specifications are gonna be more of a benefit uh, with the latest generation of a IPS or IPS like base displays having a benefit over VA. VA does have a benefit from contrast, but generally right now where you see most VA based solutions is gonna be for curved base displays. So a lot of our curved base monitors you're gonna find are all going to be VA based panels, okay? Uh, hey, William. No, I haven't gotten to the Strix LC yet. Uh, be getting there in a little bit. Okay. All right, guys. So that takes care of the ROG Swift uh, PG38UQ. So that guy will be coming in at $999. So essentially $1,000. I think that's a great proposition. Uh, if you really want a really nice just 4K high refresh rate gaming monitor, you want something just big, bold, bright, fast, with a lot of connectivity and flexibility, I think it's a great choice. So um, I, I'm a really big fan of that display. And I think, like I said, it's just gonna be so much more manageable than a 42 or 48 inch version. So uh, I think it's gonna be a very popular option amongst a lot of people. Dan asks, uh, why does Asus not make monitors with glossy screens? Uh, well, uh, monitors really don't benefit from glossy screens. Uh, I think the majority of the community has asked for it has really just been from users transitioning from TVs, uh, where you see it more commonly where they have glossy displays. But the reality is that monitors, because they have to be utilized and they're looked at, I think even longer than a lot of times and then you have with TVs, they have to be a lot more sensitive to kind of light reflection, right? Because you're sitting so close to items, you have to compensate for that. And a glossy display, really, you can have it to be the point where there's so much reflection that, you know, you could be seeing yourself in the mirror. You could see ambient light and haloing that can kind of come up in there. And that can actually also affect color rendering performance, which is the reason why almost all high-end professional displays, none of them come with glossy displays. They all come with matte displays. They even come with hoods because they really want to mitigate any type of actually... Um, they want to mitigate any type of reflection handling. Um, but that doesn't mean that we're not open to it. Uh, our, I, our team, I can tell you, we actually are evaluating and looking at the possibility of maybe having some glossy options in the future. Right now, nothing to announce. It is something that we are looking at, as we know that there are some users that would definitely like to see kind of glossy options. And they say, hey, we can control our environment. We're not concerned about you know reflections. 
some people say that, but the reality is you can actually really see there's a lot of people that get a monitor and they're like, actually, people that said glossy was a requirement and now I get it and it looks great and I don't have any problems with it. It really kind of shows evidentiary that there can be sometimes cons criticism that is kind of put out there, which is not really founded, I think, in real world use. It's just more kind of a generalized criticism that some people have a, an opinion that say something glossy is inherently better than, than matte. And the reality is both of them have value propositions. Glossy can provide you that nice additional kind of little bit pop, but for me, Definitely looking side by side, I don't really feel that it's a clear advent, uh, advantage. And like I said, in scenarios where you have to deal with more overhead lighting, it can significantly be worse, right? And so I think that's the main reason why we prioritize producing matte-based displays. But does that mean that we will never have a glossy display? No. Uh, like I said, we're definitely taking a look at it. And you know, if we have an announcement, rest assured, we'll definitely talk about it, not only in the PCDI group, but we'll definitely talk about it here on the stream, okay? All right. Um, so next up, let's go ahead and uh, get into the XD4 really quick. And then I think we're going to go ahead and jump into the two graphics cards, guys. So let me go ahead and get this one up here. Give me one second. Okay. All right, guys. So here we're going to go ahead and talk about the Zen Wi-Fi XD4 Plus. This is going to be uh, for the white three pack. OK, and so this is going to be a Wi-Fi six base unit. Um, you can see right here in terms of kind of the uh, relative kind of validated coverage space you can see. So essentially 4,800 square feet. So that's very, very large. That's bigger than the two story home that I have. That really means that you could be covering essentially your whole house, kind of your garage, your patio, your front yard, your backyard, a lot of space. Right. Um, and then this being a Wi-Fi six router really can allow you to have a great experience regardless of what you're going to be doing, whether it's going to be streaming, whether it's going to be uploading, whether it's going to be downloading um, a very, very rich and performance based experience. Right. Um, so the other nice thing about these units is that they're kind of very clean, minimal in terms of their overall design, right? Uh, again, we have them both in white and black, but this is specifically for the white model. Um, in terms of kind of the design, the cool thing is that it comes with mounting holes and a screw pack that allows you to go ahead and mount this on the wall. So if you want to be able to actually optimally position it, most traditional units don't have this flexibility or it's additional hardware that you have to purchase. Um, we also do have the ability if your home has wired essentially networking built into it or you have gone ahead and integrated wired kind of ports in your uh, house you can take advantage of what's called an ethernet backhaul a lot of people don't necessarily understand the way mesh networking products work but they utilize something that's called a backhaul so you can either have your backhaul in a wired or wireless configuration so if you understand a dual band router you have like a 2.4 and you have a 5 gigahertz band the way that the actual nodes talk to each other is by using one of those bands so it takes one of those bands and then reserves it to talk to the other routers. So you actually lose one band. Your dual band router becomes a single band router in effect, but it stabilizes and it strengthens that essentially that single band to be able to provide very good performance and very good coverage. Now, the cool thing is if you use the ethernet backhaul, you can actually maintain both bands. So it's a better option to give you actually faster speeds and more flexibility for more devices, right? So you can isolate 2.4 to 5 gigahertz if you want to um, through the software. Um, or you can, of course, maintain what we call a smart SSID, which means that uh, you don't know the bands that exist. And essentially just you connect them and the router will automatically assign the devices to whatever band it thinks is going to work best with it. OK, um, but we offer both. You can do an Ethernet backhaul or you can do a wireless backhaul. That's all very easy to set up. Um, and unlike other uh, units in the marketplace, the really cool thing is that we've gone ahead and kind of preset these units all up. So you pretty much just have to power the unit up and then it has auto synchronization for all the hubs in the package. So pretty much you just power it on and follow the instructions in the app. Um, and literally probably within a couple minutes, you're going to be up and running and set up with your Wi-Fi. So very, very simple. And then you've got tons and tons of options. I'm not going to go through all the networking options that we have, but there's a lot of great functions and features that we have from easy prioritization of things like streaming or gaming. Um, work at home, um, different types of services that you can just enable within the wrap. You have on VPN based functionality you have available to you. There's integrated security functionality, which is built in, which also does not require subscription fee like some other companies where we have things like uh, website monitoring and filtering, uh, where if there's like a malicious server or a link that you click on, 
we can actually automatically block that and stop that from actually being connected to and that's consistently updated and over time uh, we actually co-work with trend micro who has a leading ip engine that gets updated in this regard and gets fed to the router and that information is always dynamically being updated to help to kind of protect you and the devices you have across your network so a lot of really cool stuff again for the price point i think a very very reasonable um a mesh networking solution and of course we have much higher end options we have units that of course go to tri-band um, higher performing Wi-Fi 6, uh, Wi-Fi 6E, upcoming Wi-Fi 7. We even have quad band based solutions as well. So whatever kind of the usage configuration is you want, uh, we definitely have you covered, whether it's with a traditional router or whether it's with one of our mesh networking products. Okay. Uh, David goes, tri-band um, is good for using a third band as a backhaul. Yes, um, I've talked about that in the past. That's one of the kind of the key benefits of going to a higher end router, a tri-band race router, is using essentially one of those bands as a dedicated backhaul. And then you can maintain two high speed bands. So yeah, I, I still feel if you can do wired, uh, the wired backhaul is the best option because then you can keep all three bands exposed, right? And same thing with a quad band, quad bands even better than a tri band because you can then have one band dedicated to the essentially backhaul and then you can still have three bands exposed, which definitely becomes advantageous if you have a Wi-Fi 6E ecosystem of devices because Wi-Fi 6E operates at a higher essentially frequency than you would have with your traditional Wi-Fi devices. So you can have just a dedicated super fast band, then you can have a kind of a uh, somewhat fast band which works well for a lot of devices and then your 2.4 gigahertz band which can be used for a lot of kind of your remote IOT based devices general devices that they don't need a lot of speed but they just need a stable and reliable wireless connection right all right um, so that takes care of our Zen Wi-Fi uh, XD4 plus okay and that guy again coming in at a very reasonable price point of 169.99 is going to be the price point for the Zen Wi-Fi XD4 Plus. So now let's go ahead and touch about our graphics cards right here. We're going to go ahead and take a look here at the RG Strix LC GeForce RTX 4090 OC. So uh, this is going to be um, not the flagship because, of course, we did announce the Matrix. The Matrix will be our highest end limited edition, um, of course, 4090 based graphics card. But this is going to be a fantastic option for those that are looking for a super performant, um, cool, compact card uh, compared to something like the RG Strix. Now, the RG Strix card is already extremely performant. It's it's really class leading and it offers really impressive thermal performance. Um, in fact, the actual thermal performance is very similar and in some situations it actually can even be quieter than this card. Um, it just comes down to kind of dimensions. Now, this is gonna be a 2.6 slot card and then you're gonna have a much larger card with the ROG Strix 4090, right? So dimensionally, this is a bit more compact, but you also still have to account for the tubing and you have to account for the radiator. But um, in terms of even the radiator, we went with the 240 because it allows for outstanding thermal performance, but it also allows for the highest level of interoperability and compatibility within chassis because 240 can easily go in and pretty much all types of different types of chassis configurations. So you can go ahead and take advantage of it. Um, it maintains the design like we had in the prior generation where you have that really cool slatted RGB based accent design if you want to go with a vertical mount. If you want to go with the horizontal mount, that's always my preferred mounting design. That's my preference. Um, you still get some RGB accenting. You then have, of course, your 12 volt high power connector, a metal backplate based design. It does have a dual V bio switch, so performance and quiet mode. Um, both are quiet, but of course, if you want the quietest operation, you go with the quiet mode. And if you want, uh, of course, uh, the best performance, right, but with a little bit more aggressive fan speeds, then you go with performance. But again, both of them are going to be quiet. So it's not really that you have to kind of, you have to go into quiet mode just to be able to get a cool and quiet experience. Now, in terms of the RGB lighting design, you can fully course customize and synchronize this through the Armory Crate software suite. Uh, you have a high performance, of course, uh, plate design, which makes contact, of course, with the GPU and with the memory. And then we have a specialized heatsink body that makes contact with the rest of the board level componentry. And then there's an actually uh, auxiliary blower fan in there, which provides airflow across the actual PCB and the VRM components. So you have essentially two layers of cooling that's occurring, right? One from the actual cold plate, which is part of the integrated AO solution. And then we have a kind of active uh, thermal dissipation that's occurring between the heatsink and with the assist fan that's there. Okay. And you can go into the GP tweak software to customize that. So if you want to set your own custom fan curves, you can do that. 
The max power target is going to be the same as it is for the ROG Strix and the Tough Gaming card, so you can go up to a max of 600 watts. Um, you're pretty much going to be constrained, though, is that you're not going to be able to utilize that because you are going to be more limited in terms of voltage than you would be in terms of the max power limit. Um, it is going to have the same factory clock speed programmed in as the ROG Strix card, and it will have a higher than default TGP. Um, so that just means that the default power target on the card is higher than standard. So the default is 450 watt. This is a 500 watt TGP. So it is just essentially just a higher level of performance. That along with the factory overclock are kind of two additional ways that you get a bump up in perm performance. So the higher TGP, the higher clock speed, and then the high end cooling performance helps to nominalize and keep the high clock speeds consistent. So those are the three ways that you get that kind of boosted level of performance with the card, along with, of course, keeping very, very good temperature performance for this model, okay? Uh, now let's go ahead and take a little bit of closer look at some of the internal elements here of the card. Let me bring this up right here. So in terms of your rear uh, I.O., pretty straightforward, right? You've got your HDMI 2, and then you got 3 DP. Um, we still maintain our uh, stainless steel I.O. bracket. I believe we're the only manufacturer that actually does a stainless steel I.O. bracket. That reduces uh, oxidation and also allows for better rigidity. Um, just helps to also mitigate things like a little bit of sag because you have a more rigid material uh, that's present. Uh, premium super alloy powered base VRM design. These are all fully rated molded inductors, high performance, of course, power stages, high performance base capacitors, uh, premium PCB. Other little small hallmarks that you may not even realize, we're the only manufacturer that uses this GPU bonding technique on our actual GPU die in our production process, which is a way to improve the overall durability and reliability of the graphics card production and the cards. Uh, so we're the only manufacturer that actually does that. You can check all of the graphics cards. None of them else have this GPU bonding design on them. Um, the card also does maintain the fan connect two headers right there. So if you want to connect auxiliary fans to this, uh, maybe like front intake fans or something like that, you could connect two fans to those headers and have those fans respond to the GPU temperature. You could actually have them respond to the GPU temperature and to not to this, just the CPU temperature. Okay, and then in terms of the actual uh, 12 volt high power connector, there's also something that some users get a little bit confused about. So I wanna talk about a little bit more, but that's going to be the actual PCI power monitoring circuit design. And so um, on these actual graphics cards, we actually have a feature that is exclusive to the ROG Strix cards. And this is going to be a PCI power monitoring circuit. So um, what is the fundamental difference on the other cards, like on the tough gaming cards and older designs, essentially when you connected the PCI express power connector or the 12 volt high power connector, it would have just essentially an input detection. So no, hey, power is being fed there and an LED light would turn on. But in the newer generation, what we actually did is we implemented actually an intelligent circuit design. So the intelligent circuit design actually helps to monitor some deviation within the ATX specification. So essentially, if the input power has a deviance of about 10%, the LEDs will actually trigger and they will engage. And that helps to let you know that there's a little bit of variance. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that there's something wrong with the card or that there's something wrong with the power supply, but there's a little bit of operating deviation. Sometimes this can happen from connectors that maybe aren't fully seated. Sometimes it can happen from poor quality designed extensions. Sometimes it can also happen from a PSU that's maybe operating a little bit more on the margins, right? So it's not maybe as tight in terms of this regulation and it's operating but it's operating maybe a little bit outside of where it should be, right? And so that's something that you could then decide, do you want to run a maybe a more extensive kind of a power supply stress test and check your actual voltages? Um, you can do that in utilities like OCCT or HW Info. You can actually check your 12 volt high power um, stability and kind of see is it kind of going up or down or is it kind of staying nominally consistent and that is a kind of a cool additional benefit that we have in terms of the overall design of the card so again when you get the rg strix cards they come with that power sense uh, that power sensing design whereas on the tough gaming cards you just get general power input detection so keep that in mind there's two differences between the two okay um, and that overall is going to be the main differentials uh, in terms of what this card brings to the table compared to some of the other cards. Now, this is also still going to be utilizing our ASUS Auto Extreme production process. And so if you're not familiar with the Auto Extreme production process, um, I can show you a little bit of a snippet of video here. So let me go ahead and show you guys here. Um, so 
This is essentially uh, the process that we implemented a number of years ago. We were the first manufacturer to unilaterally move to full SMT production. So that means using an advanced actually robotic system to be able to place all of our components. It also actually is um, inclusive of how we actually pick and select all of our components. So everything from the power stages to the MOSFETs to the capacitors and the validation that we go in, the uh, optical inspection process that we use to actually verify the production of the graphics cards, all of that is part of the Auto Extreme production process. The cool thing is I will say is that the Auto Extreme production process isn't unique to just the RSG Strix card. Even when I talk about the dual RX 7600 card, it's also used for that card. So whether you buy our most entry ASUS graphics cards to our highest in graphics cards, they're all produced utilizing our ASUS Auto Extreme production process. It even includes things like the removal of additional kind of solder path, right, which helps to also reduce heating um, to the PCB board and to components. So there's a lot of nice benefits to this production process that help to ultimately just give a better design card, right, with superior reliability, durability, and accuracy and pre precision in the production. So that is going to be the Auto Extreme production process if you're not familiar with it, okay? So uh, let me go ahead and see. Uh, Sum in note says that the Matrix will be the best. Looks futuristic. Yeah, I think the Matrix is going to be great, but the Matrix is also going to be a limited edition card. So it would only be produced in a, sm a smaller quantity. The LC will be more broadly available. Excuse me. Um, Michael notes, still no USB-C. Um, yeah, I mean, USB-C, you could get an adapter if you wanted to. The reality is that these are high-performing based displays. Um, so all high-performance gaming displays, none of them use USB-C as the primary input connection. So it doesn't make sense to use USB-C as your output, right? Because you could, one, you could get an adapter cable easily. So you get HDMI to USB-C if you really needed it for some reason. But the reality is all your gaming displays, you're gonna either use HDMI 2.1 or you're going to use a display port, right? Uh, Michael notes says, why not also have ARGB? We used to have ARGB, we uh, removed it. And that's just because users weren't utilizing it and they fed back that, um, you know, why have a specification that isn't kind of actively being utilized? So um, if you want it back, then, you know, I'd love to see if you can get other people to really convey and express that they want to see that feature introduced because we did used to have an ARGB uh, output header on the graphics card along with um, the Fan Connect 2 headers, but the usage rate was low, so we ultimately removed that off of the graphics card. Okay. Um, MUFC is asking about using the adapter cable. For an adapter cable, because this card uses a higher TGP, you want to, at a minimum, be using three, right? But you would want to use the full extent of the power adapter cable. So that's pretty much going to be either using a native 16 pin. So native 16 pin cable, which comes from the power supply, which would be fine. If uh, you've got a Thor with the adapter, that's fine, right? So the Thor with the adapter cable that comes included, that will entirely work fine. If you're going to use the included adapter cable inside the box, then the included adapter cable inside the box is going to split out to a four PCIe cable configuration, okay? So either one of those will work, all right? Okay, so that is going to be uh, for uh, the ROG Strix 4090LC. And let me go ahead and uh, go ahead here. So that is going to be coming in at $2,200 essentially for the ROG Strix LC 4090OC, okay? And then last but not least, let's go ahead and touch on here. We're going to have the dual Radeon RX 7600 that we're going to go ahead and touch on. So this is going to be a nice addition for those that are going to be probably looking for a card where you're focusing on something that's going to be in that 1080p segment, right? So you're looking for a modern generation card, compact, pretty power efficient, right? Be able to give you high refresh rate gaming performance at 1080p. And even I think a solid 1440p gaming performance for a large number of games. Uh, you can actually comfortably drive a lot of games even at over 60 frames a second, 90, 120 frames a second. A lot of it depends of course on the game engine, right? Uh, the Witcher 3 is gonna be different than Destiny, which is gonna be different from Halo, which is gonna be different from Forza, which is gonna be different from Cyberpunk or Diablo, right? Uh, but overall, uh, it's gonna be able to offer you a, a solid gaming experience across a wide range of titles at either one of those resolutions and again uh, the dual design is nice and compact so it works well for a large number of chassis configurations whether you want to go for kind of smaller form factor sff type builds medium form factor builds or larger atx based builds uh, you have a 
metal backplate based design, single PCI Express 8 pin power connector. So very simple, very easy for uh, broad level of compatibility on new builds and old builds alike, or maybe even if you're upgrading, maybe an older kind of pre-built system, right? Which is gonna be nice. Uh, two, static pressure optimized axial take base fans. Also built utilizing the ASUS Auto Extreme production process. Clean compact profile in terms of the overall design. So it's like I said, gonna be able to fit in a lot of different systems in that regard. No RGB lighting or control software, just a simple, clean, neutral design in terms of the card, okay? And then also we will have an RG Strix variant if you want something that's gonna be a little bit kind of um, higher end in terms of the overall kind of color aesthetic and whatnot, right? But um, the dual is gonna be the primary model that we're gonna be focusing on. So let me go ahead and bring that up here. And so this one will be coming in at 279.99, so essentially 280. You can see it's actually boost clock configuration, right? 2.5 slot. It will support the zero dB operating mode. A lot of users get a little confused about the zero dB operating mode. That just essentially just means that when the card is operating underneath a certain temperature and wattage target, the fans don't spin, which is entirely normal. If you don't want that function, you can turn it off so the fans always run. But for me, I love that feature. It's nice that, you know, if I'm just checking my email, maybe looking at some photos, playing some music, right? Or, or playing some very minimal light games that just don't load the GPU up heavily. Uh, there's no reason to even have the fan spin. So it will run essentially in its quietest mode, which is in that zero dB operating mode, right? Um, also maintains the stainless steel bracket, just like we talked about with the LC based model, okay? Uh, let's go ahead and quickly take a look here at the specifications in terms of the dimensions for this guy. So you're gonna see 8.1 by five inches by 2.0 inches in terms of the Z height and only a 550 watt power supply in terms of its recommendation. So quite conservative in terms of that regard. All right, so that takes care of it there. Um, T9 Con 2200, yes. If so you're asking about the RG Strix LC, the 4090 2200, that is correct, okay. Uh, six speed death. Is any chance Asus will start selling fans included with various AIOs in cases separately? No, we have no plans to sell fans independently, but we do offer um, two independent fans that we already produced. We have the RG Strix XF120, which are just pure black fans. They're great fans for the price point. Maglev bearing, really, really nice. Um, some of my favorite fans that we offer in terms of their overall kind of performance. Um, and overall design. And then we also have our Tough Gaming ARGB fans, which I think for the price point are some of the absolute best ARGB fans. They have a really, really nice advanced FDB bearing uh, that comes in there, really nice premium controller. You can get them in a single pack or you can get them in a four pack. We have them in the black and we'll have them in white probably by the end of this month. So we'll have the white and then the black. And then eventually we will have an, a dedicated ROG uh, ARGB fan, which will come out um, probably late this year. Um, I don't know the exact timeline, but we are working on one. But right now, as far as the fans that come included with any of the AIOs, those are matched specific to the AIOs. So we don't have any plans to sell those independently. All right. So that takes care of pretty much all of our new products, guys. So um, I'm going to go ahead and see if I can bring up the PC Daiwa Builder Spotlight here. Um, see if I got a little bit of time to squeeze some of those in. And if anybody has any other questions that I haven't gotten to, feel free to go ahead and drop those in the chat. And I'll do my best to go ahead and get to those when I can. So give me one second here. Uh, 140 millimeter fans. Yeah, we've had some feedback on that. The reality is that 140 millimeter fans don't really have that much, so I think, of uh, justification, right? The reality is that 120 millimeter has been so highly optimized in terms of static pressure, performance, uh, choice selection, um, mechanical interoperability that I think it's it's really where the lion's share of the market is. 140 millimeters, a little bit kind of more this kind of niche. Um, you know, you have started to finally get more, much better chassis support that allows for 140 millimeter uh, fans. And it is something we are evaluating. Of course, we do have AIO coolers in 280 millimeter configurations, which have 140 millimeter base fans. Um, and we, of course, have chassis that support 120s and 140s. But right now, we have no immediate plans to release a 140 millimeter fan. But it is something that we have discussed internally. And I think once we have kind of a more kind of complete um, product stack, then that's something that we could evaluate saying, you know, do we think it makes sense to kind of put out a specific 140 millimeter fan offering? But uh, appreciate definitely that feedback. Um, you know, we're definitely going to continue to monitor feedback from the community as far as whether they think, 
you know, they'd like to maybe see an even higher updated 120 millimeter option, different types of 120 millimeter options before we went to a 140 or whatnot, right? So there's a lot of different things to kind of keep in mind. Um, hey, Michael, actually, I don't know that it will slowly become more the mainstream. The reality is that it, most chassis and still configuration parameters make sense. Also, thicker fans aren't necessarily better because they also uh, eat up more space, right? So um, even kind of going to the newer fans that are starting to become thicker, they're really maintaining, I think, more of an isolated segmentation uh, because the Z height that you would have to have between the spacing of the radiator and also the fan would mean that you would even have to have more Z height spacing. Um, so as long as you're maintaining a chassis that allows for that space, then it makes sense. But otherwise, it actually com it, it, it eats more space in. And when you also consider the Z height of things like BRM heat sinks, which have also gotten bigger, um, you actually have to balance the design optimally. And when it talks about um, longevity, longevity is going to be much more affected actually by the bearing quality than anything else, right? And in that regard, the thickness of the fan is irrelevant to that, right? Um, and that's where, like I said, like the tough gaming fan has a significantly better bearing than you're going to fan on the vast majority of fans. There's a lot of premium fans that people buy right now, uh, ARGB fans on the market, and they use a hydraulic 80K rated bearing fan. And the tough gaming fan is an advanced FDB bearing based fan, which is over 250,000 hours. And that's going to be a much, much bigger indicator of the low reliability. And also the flexibility on whether you can mount the fan vertically or horizontally as um, self sealed designs that are lubricated tend to perform better in different axes, meaning that you can kind of have them horizontal or vertical and they're going to perform the same um, tonality wise, performance wise, um, be more resistant to variability and temperature and things along those lines. So that's a bigger factor than necessarily the speed rating or some of those other things that you're kind of noting there, right? Um, hey, MVC, I use 140 millimeter for less noise. Well, that's interesting. I don't know that I think, I, to me, I don't find that necessarily it's less noise. I think the total design of the fan is more important about doing less, less noise because, um, you know, 1200 RPM, most, most fan curves, if you're talking about a sweet spot of a fan curve, you're probably running somewhere between 400 to maybe about 1400 RPM. Um, that fan range between whether it's 400 to 1400 RPM on a 120 to a uh, 140 is going to be similar. And I would probably say that there's more choices on the 120 to get better bearings and better frame designs that are going to be quieter than 140s. So in theory, maybe it could be that you get more airflow. But again, the, the designs have been so well established and improved upon on 120s that I don't know that it necessarily that alignment holds up always to say that the 140s are always kind of like a better experience of being able to be quieter. Um, but offering the same cooling performance, right? But I think you can have good performance for sure. So I think you can have both. Um, but that's part of the you know flexibility of PC DIY. If you find that it works better for you, that's a great thing. Just go with a 140 base solution versus a 120 base solution, right? Um, all right, let me go ahead and bring up this submission form here and see if I can get these up here. So give me one second, guys, and we'll get this up here. All right, uh, let me go ahead and see here. Okay, yep, okay. Uh, it? Oh, it looks like I did not bring over those images, so let me go ahead and just download them quickly here, guys. Just take me a moment. And roll my guys, so I could bring them over here. Okay, uh, where can I, let's see, too many folders. <laughs> uh, that's a quick question for the chat. How many folders do you have right now on your desktop? Let me know. Okay. Okay, we got the images here, and let's go ahead and put this one in. This is going to be from Brent Rambo. And uh, I don't think I have a name for this system here. Uh, let me see if there's actually a name here that we have for this build.
Okay, so this is, does it have a name? Um, ah, split personality. Okay, there we go. That, that's, there we go. All right, guys, so let's go ahead and take a look at Split Personality from Brett Rambo. This is a pretty cool build. And again, uh, for anybody who's joining us for the first time on the stream, this is part of our PCDI Way Builder Spotlight. So of course, it's your opportunity to be able to submit your systems that feature ASUS hardware as part of the stream. And we'd love to be able to show them off and talk about them here in the build. So if you're interested, all you gotta do is be part of ASUS PCDIY group, head over to the featured post, um, and then just uh, load it up into the Google submission form and you're good to go. And you can be part of the ASUS PCDIY Builder Spotlight. All right, so let's go ahead and take a look here. All right. Uh, as I see, we got a little bit of feedback from people. 41, all named new folder. <laughs> okay. Uh, four with about 101, right? So, yeah. So, the folders within the folders, right? Okay. Um, and then uh, Techno Ninja is asking, will the Ryogen 360 uh, Black ARGB version release on Amazon on day one? Also, do new products typically go on sale for Amazon Prime Days? Um, I can't really speak to Amazon Prime Days or tell you anything about that. Um, if we have advanced visibility on what we might have, we'll try to let you know that in the PCDIY group. But generally, with new products, there's not usually promotions that happen, right? Usually trying to find promotions on something that might have been maybe available for at least about three to six months. Um, as far as the uh, Black ARGB Edition, no. The two models that are right now releasing right now are just the ones with the Noctua-based fans. The next models that we'll be releasing will probably be the black version and probably last will probably be the white version right but once we're ready to release either one of those again we'll be posting them and talking about them either in the following stream these happen every friday or be posted in the pcdiy group so you can definitely follow us there and erica notes 23 folders so that's quite a number of folders right there all right uh let's go ahead and take a look here at this build here um so again this is a uh, brett rambo sprit personality all right All right, so right off the bat, I'm really digging the kind of the very stealthy vibes that we have here. Some beautiful photography too. Some really, really nice job here in terms of the actual uh, points of contrast. So the really cool thing that I really, really like right here is going to be that they didn't go purely all stealth, right? There's a little bit of color blocking right here. So there's a really nice kind of uh, color scheme that you can see right here with the light kind of teal or blue, right? And then the darker kind of more consistent kind of, I won't say navy, but you have that darker kind of blue that's in there, right? And then a little bit of this nice gradient that's been played around here within the Lanny Uni fans that you have also where again you've got that little bit of softer blue um, that teal and then you've got the darker blue right and that really adds to a nice I think uh, contrast right you're creating a nice little bit of a color blocking effect you're also playing around a little bit with the reflective tendency that we have on the Strix board where you can see some nice little bit right here where there's a little bit of iridescence you have a little bit of color play off of there a little bit of the RGB lighting there within the actual velocity block from EK. And then some really interesting touch points right here too with this like a uh, carbon fiber almost like material here on the tubing. I'm gonna be interested to see is this like carbon fiber tubing? Um, is it uh, some a wrap that goes over the tubing or what's kind of the exact thing going on right here? But pretty slick, pretty clean, really liking the overall color scheme, uh, really nice overall design in terms of, I think, the layout. So you can also tell this is a compact build because if you haven't noticed, this design right here, this is gonna be a hallmark of a Dash I-based motherboard. So that means that this is a mini ITX-based system. So it's a very compact, but you can tell a very performant-based design. So uh, taking a look right here, we can see really nice clean cable management. Of course, those nice uni fans that we have integrated in there. Combs on all of the cables would look really, really nice there as well. Um, here looking on the front, very, very cool. Here you can see, of course, the split personality, I guess where that makes sense, right? Where you can see cool etching that's on that panel, but that etching is done really, really, really nicely. I like that translucent design. Now you can tell from the chassis that they've gone ahead and selected with that the ID design normally wouldn't be that strong, quote unquote, from the front. It's one of the reasons why I like more traditional chassis designs, because you have a more strong facade in the front of the chassis where generally chassis like this, they look best from the side because you can see the components, but they don't really have a strong identity from the front. So here it's cool to be able to see actually a theme, a composition, some design built in and actually etched into the quote unquote front of the chassis, right? So that's pretty, pretty nice. 
Um, of course, maintaining some continuity there with the actual water block selection. So EK for the CPU block and also EK for the GPU block. Really nice and clean. I do like this nice, uh, simple kind of design language that, uh, that the Vector series blocks have in terms of this nice little RGB accent line. It's really nice, gives it a nice little pop to it. Um, I still, I don't know if it's my favorite for the generation. Um, I'm torn as far as who's my favorite block for this generation, but really nice design. And I think it definitely goes with the vibe and the look of the system. Really, really uh, well done and definitely, um, aligns really well, of course, between the CPU block because they're both from the same uh, series, right? That carbon fiber also really, really nice there in terms of its overall design accents. Now, moving to the back right here, really nice job on the cable management, really clean. Uh, I mean, it's surprisingly well done, right? Where you can see it's really been packed in there really nice. Uh, cool addition to see here is that it's the ROG Loki. So that's our SFXL based PSU. So you can get this in up to a thousand watts. It's also an ATX 3.0 or uh, SFX based rated equivalent, right? Um, new power supply, right? Where you have the native 12 volt high power connection. Um, so it can equally support these high end kind of compact systems. Um, you can see all that's routed in there right here. You've got the distro integration, the pump integration, really nice custom cables. So they went with custom cables across the board. These are not extensions. They're full custom cables that go directly into the PSU. And there you can go with the panel on in there. Almost a shame to cover that all up because this is so nicely managed, but uh, it helps definitely bring it kind of all together, right? Really like this nice little accent piece. That's really, really nicely done. Yeah, that's that's a beautiful build. I mean, uh, it really, it's kind of just hard to kind of negate, I think, almost any any element on there, right? Uh, it's, a, it's really got a really nice polish to it. So let me go ahead and bring up here some of the details on this, and we can read a little bit more about this, right? So give me one second here. All right, and so, so this is gonna be from Brett here. And so he goes, um, after months of work, I'm pleased to present Project Split Personality. Uh, this build is for a close friend of mine of 30 plus years. Oh, that's pretty cool. It's always nice to be able to kind of, I think, um, do something for our friends and for our family and for people that mean a lot to us. So we've gamed um, together competitively across multiple games and we've worked together and our families have been close for over two decades. And he gave me, um, complete creative freedom on this build. So that's really cool. So he kind of really must trust you, right? Uh, because especially with a high-end build like this, you've got to have a lot of confidence that that person has a sense of what you like aesthetically and you know, really going to like the way that it kind of comes out. The only strict requirement was that it had to be a closed case as his office uh, can tend to get very dusty. So it had to be able to be fully sealed. Uh, his office is pretty small. So he also went with a compact base design. Um, so while these images make the system look larger than life, it's all has inside of a Lian Li O11 Mini, right? So this definitely is a compact chassis, which makes sense because again, we're using a mini ITX based motherboard. You can see the ROG Strix Dash I board in there. His favorite color is blue. And one of the car, uh, one of the card games he plays, and one of his favorite um, cards has blue, cyan, black, and purple. So you can perfectly see all those colors represented in the build. And I themed it to bring that element into the build beyond just his MMO characters. Right? Uh, this machine features a completely custom water distribution block. Right? So that custom water distribution block we can see right here is um, that's all that beautiful work that we can see in the front here. So let me see if we can. Uh, you can see it right here, of course, right there a little bit more clearly. So you can see right here that full distribution block, right? That's all can customize. So it looks really, really nice. Um, custom distribution block and reservoir that I designed and machined. So that's cool. Um, definitely doing uh, like Sneff and like, like some of the best builders and modders out there where he entirely did it himself. Um, I also designed and built a custom RGB circuit board, which I could tell because that was pretty interesting. Um, the RGB circuit board, which is on the back right here, uh, which is this guy right here. I was wondering, it's like, I haven't seen an RGB controller or, or a board that looks like this, but you can see it follows all that is in the, the same design aesthetic. So it's pretty cool that he actually custom did one as well. So big props to you. Definitely took uh, the DIY, I think, even further than what we would traditionally see within many builds, right? Um, 
I machined it into a plate and sandwiched it inside of a distribution block and then diffused illumination of the V logo, which embossed an eight millimeter thick inside of the water channel. Uh, the machine also features a custom laser edge piece of artwork um, by Philip J. Newman, an award-winning tat a tattoo artist uh, containing the three main characters my friend has played across uh, 20 years of gaming together. Um, everything on the front side is blue, black, and carbon. Uh, everything on the back is black and silver, giving the machine itself a split personality. So I can definitely see where he's talking about right there. And I think it's really contiguous. It almost doesn't feel split in that way because just it's, it feels really contiguous. It feels like it has a purpose full design and an identity that came across beautifully and I think he did a fantastic job right here. Um, my diehard exotic car fan so naturally I had to incorporate some custom fiber tubing. So that tubing is actually custom fiber which is pretty sweet as well as custom cabling, custom sleeving and a custom plate inside the rear wire, wire management area. A custom logo plane on the pump cover, custom engraved rear back cover, and modified custom land lead controller, allowing me to control the individual fans and the individual RGB components separately. The cable combs are also custom designed to account for the 40 series signal wires in a more visually uh, pleasing way. That's pretty sweet. And that's actually what he means right here, because this is a pretty rarity where you generally don't see these uh, combs, right, specific for the 40 series cards yet. So yeah, um, that's really a nice attention to detail. So all the way, um, yeah, I mean, it's a fantastic build uh, in terms of car hardware, 13900KS, this is an RG Strix Z790-I, an RG Loki 1000-watt uh, SFXL base power supply, a 4090 base graphics card, 6400MT kit of memory in there, 32 gigabytes, um, a 1 and 2 terabyte um, and PCIe NVMe M.2 base SSD setup, that's all inside the O11, and then the Velocity 2 for the CPU and the GPU block, DDC EK pump. Um, also, the pump cover and rads and fittings are all from EK as well. And then they land the um, SL120 Infinity fans. And then pretty much all the other things that you saw were all custom work there. Pretty sweet. A pretty nice done. So overall, pretty cool. Uh, Michael gives it some love and says, beautiful assembly. Love it. I would agree. I think he did a fantastic job. I gets a big thumbs up from me. H2O Computers also gives it some love right there, calls it out, and says a wonderful build. Um, very, very nicely done. So that gets a big thumbs up from me. So let's go ahead and round things up. Actually, speaking of H2O Computers, I think we've got one build that I think I can get to from them. So let me go ahead and bring up their submission form, and we'll get ready to wrap things up. So give me one second, guys, here to download this one. Zoom in also gives some love right there to Brett. Uh, notes a, an awesome build. I agree. I thought that build turned out really, really nicely. I really like the colors. I really like the colors. All right. So let's see here. Do I got them? All right. Yes. Here we go. All right. Let me get these downloaded here really quick. And anybody that was seeing all the game announcement news, what were you most excited of? What game were you, did you see that you are super juiced about that's going to be coming out? Uh, I mean, there's a lot of really exciting games. Of course, I know a lot of people are talking about, of course, the expansions that are going to be coming for Cyberpunk, right? Um, and then, of course, you've got uh, Starfield, right, which was, of course, a big one. Uh, for me, I think I'm most excited about the next uh, 40K game, right, the next update to the Space Marine franchise. Uh, I'm really excited about that game. I think it looks awesome. So that, for me, and I'm still a huge fan, and I'm enjoying Company Heroes 3 right now, and, of course, looking forward to the expansions. But uh, there's also tons of indie games. I mean, I'd probably say that maybe close to, um, you know, 50% of my favorite games in the last five to six years have all been quote unquote indie based titles as opposed to triple A based titles or larger based titles. So I'd love to see, um, you know, what were your guys' thoughts? Was there anything that you were super excited about? I will say I am very excited on triple A side uh, about the, of course, the next update to Forza, which I think is going to be fantastic. Um, and there are some other, quite a number of really cool titles that do really look come out. And it's a lot of really cool technologies that are also coming out in terms of gameplays. But, um, Let's see. Let's see what a couple of people say. So, Asia Computer says Starfield and Star Wars. Of course, I think that makes sense. Star Wars Outlaw. Yeah, I would definitely agree. It's looking pretty cool. Um, I'm waiting for First Ascendant. Yeah. Um, Asia Computer says the Avatar, Avatar game looks pretty cool too. Yeah, I think a lot of people actually were surprised by maybe that kind of the Avatar game, right? Because sometimes I think, uh, you know, movie 
uh, movie games don't necessarily always come out the strongest in terms of the development cycle, but from my understanding, I guess that game development has been mirroring kind of the longer life cycle that they had also within the films. Um, and actually, I really like the, the latest Avatar film, and I'm excited to kind of see what Cameron's doing right there. So it'll be interesting to see kind of how it plays into the game, uh, how it plays into the movie, into the narrative, and being able to find out more about the, the characters and the environment and the world and everything like that. And so I, I think it definitely is going to be an interesting thing to kind of see how it continues to evolve. So that's pretty cool. So let's go ahead and take a look right here uh, let me bring up the name here for this build and we will get into it so this one is going to be um, EK Tough Gaming H.O. Computers oh Prince of Purge ah Erica says 40k yep yep definitely for sure she gets a thumbs up uh prince of persia i will admit the new prince of persia actually does look really cool i'm really excited about that where it's got a little bit of kind of a different um it's got a little bit more of a retro kind of aesthetic right and even i think the the view i don't want to say it's isometric right but it has a different kind of vibe to it which i think is kind of cool and kind of interesting so um yeah a lot of actually really cool a lot of really cool titles that got announced right all right, so let's go and let's see where we'll start from. Okay, let's go ahead and take a look right here. So we've got, from Asia Computers, the EK Tough Gaming. So I think it's going to pretty much make sense, right? That means it's going to probably have some water cooling and probably have some tough gaming hardware. So let's see what we've got going on right here. Um, so right off the bat, already digging, of course, this kind of classic color scheme where we've got the kind of tough gaming gold accent color that we have there with the black. Um, which is really nice soft tubing which i'm always a big fan of actually my preference always in a water cooled build is actually to have soft tubing versus hard line i think hard line it can be nice but just from a practicality standpoint it's cheaper it's easier it's just as performant um, and also i sometimes like the more fluid lines that you can have with soft tubing versus the very kind of hard perpendicular lines that we see uh, within a lot of kind of hard line especially when there's a lot of distro use distros have become so prominent now that you almost Kind of see redundancy in terms of the layout as opposed to seeing more kind of very type of layout approaches which um in next week's stream uh, i want to take a definitely look at liquify mods recent build but a great example i think some of the best builders they don't necessarily always kind of go with just running everything from Destro. they play around with the shape the form and the layout to really kind of um allow the theme to be kind of defined by them and to kind of really speak to what they're trying to achieve as opposed to just kind of going with what might be quote unquote the easiest, right? But definitely nothing wrong with the distro. It can really lend itself to being a simplified and easier run. At the same time too, perpendicular lines can hurt you because it's really easy to expose when something's not perfectly aligned and that can be a little bit of a challenge, right? Um, but overall, uh, very interesting kind of uh, things that we got going on right here. Uh, let's now take a look to the back. So pretty cool. We can see that, of course, this is all inside, of course, our split chamber chassis, which is pretty sweet. It's got the Tough Gaming. This is our latest generation PSU. Um, love to know. What do you think, Mike, on those uh, fully etched modular cables? That's actually, I think, one of the best value points that our PSU has. It's the cables I feel are the best inbox quality cables that are on the market. They're soft. They have a little bit of suppleness to them, a nice level of stranding. Um, they're flexible, but still have some nice path routing rigidity that are present in them. Very, very nice. You really don't have to feel like you have to go spend money to buy custom cables. Um, you can use the fully mesh modular cables. And the great thing is those come in all of our Tough Gaming ATX 3.0 base power supplies, right? Um, but really nice, clean layout uh, done here across the board. Um, I like the also the use of the hook and loop faster, no zip tie. That means no compression that you could potentially have too tight on the cabling. Just really nice, easy access to be able to go ahead and open those up and make adjustment if I need to right there. Um, nice routing to that thermal right controller. I think this is like their 12 port controller. I think they have like an eight or 10 or a 12 port. Um, so that makes sense because you of course have all those nice things in there. The cool thing is there, there's nothing proprietary, right? This is all just a native, clean, easy to use interface with from Armory Crate where you can go in and control and synchronize everything. Very, very simple. So if you want to keep a very clean, minimal system, not have all this kind of complex secondary controllers, I really like what Mike and H2O Computers did. Uh, I love right here, this is of course the EK, uh, uh, um, retention mechanism right there very very nice retention mechanism compared to your traditional mechanisms right there uh, fully loaded up there with some t-force memory of course that full distro integration right there you got your pump in there uh, little accents right here with of course the little colors which is pretty cool now this will be interesting do i like it more with okay so i get blue right there i think i like the blue yeah 
No, I dig that. I dig that. I like the little kind of secondary contrast right there. Now, I can see even further. Looks like he got even the Tough Gaming Alliance SSD. So, yeah, um, you'll find some of our partners actually do have Tough Gaming Alliance uh, memory, Tough Gaming Alliance SSDs, um, and some other products that are out there. But, of course, we've started to produce many of our own components in, our, uh, in addition to kind of the motherboards and graphics cards. Um, so, in that regard, there's not as many as there kind of used to be in the past, but a really nice combination right here. But I really like this build because it shows kind of like i think the essence of what tough gaming can really be about where it's like you can get a great experience not be super crazy expensive on any one of these components but still have a performant really solid looking uh system that gives you kind of everything you're looking for without going to some of the esoteric or extreme options that you might not necessarily always need right um and you know you end up paying for it, but you don't necessarily need um always a great job michaels does really tight and clean cable management on there Ooh, I'm kind of actually liking a little bit of that red there and then with that blue. That's a pretty cool uh, little pump. I don't know if I've seen that recently. That's, that's pretty cool right there. Ooh, the blue. With, I actually, I like that. I like actually the blue with the yellow accents. I, I'm digging that. Maybe I might even like that more than the than the Tough Gaming Cold. But I think maybe I probably would go with the Tough Gaming Cold. Maybe I would tinge it a little bit more to like having an orange vibe right there. I think that I think that a white and orange gradient would be kind of the white the the path that I would go. Um, but the blue one uh, definitely looks nice, and I like actually the way it works with uh, the contrast there on the yellow. Then nice clean build. I mean, again, uh, you know. Mike doesn't miss, you know, he does a great job in terms of kind of his consistency in terms of what he executes. Let me go ahead and bring up the submission form right here. Let's see what we got going on. And again, cable management was very much on point right there. Uh, which we're going to focus on. Uh, I think we can go, let's go, let's go with the, the wide shot. Yeah, let's go with those too. Okay. All right. And so let's see here. So this is going to be, <clears throat> sorry, let me go ahead. Uh, so Mike from HO Computers. Um, so does the build have a theme? 100% tough gaming. Uh, three words that were used to describe the build is versatile, performant, and futuristic. Uh, the build's name is EK Tough Gaming. Um, in terms of the hardware, we've got a Tough Gaming GT502. So that's our split chamber design, right, chassis. Um, you can get it in white or black. This is the black version right there. Um, Tough Gaming X570 Pro Wi-Fi. That's a great option for AM4. It's one of really the best boards out there just for not being super expensive, but giving you a great deal, uh, great set of features and functions. A 5800X3D. So this is a great balance of not going to the new end platform stuff, but still being a really, really kind of like high-end bang for the buck gaming system, right? But without going into maybe AM5, right? Um, then the Team Force Delta Gaming Alliance memory. So he's got uh, 32 gigabytes of that that's in there. Then a Tough Gaming 3070 base graphics card. Um, the Tough Gaming Alliance uh, Z440, uh, one terabyte M.2 base SSD. Um, then there's also Team, uh, Team Group Vulcan, one terabyte SSD. Then the Tough Gaming Fans. Uh, three of them in there, and then three Noctua Chromax fans with, of course, the Chromax, uh, I think, uh, little uh, uh, corner um, grommets, right? Um, Tough Gaming 750-watt fully modular power supply in there, and then all the water cooling hardware is pretty much EK across the board uh, with a cool stream PE360. I like that. Now, going too crazy also on the radiator, I think like that the PE is like perfect because that's going to easily handle that whole system. You're going to be all good to go, so it's a great balance right there as well. Um, and, um, and then he's also got the wing wall, uh, adapter in there, right? So that's like the only thing, like, do we, it's like, we need to make a ring wall, uh, but a tough gaming edition, right? About $1,600 for the overall budget, uh, budget for the build. What aspect of the build were they most proud of? It's final form. No zip ties were harmed in the process. Strictly hoop the noop fasters and twist ties, man. Uh, big thumbs up for me. I think you nailed it, man. Is there anything they would change about the build? No, and I would agree. I think it's done really nicely. About two days uh, to take to put to go, put it all together. Uh, what is the system used for? It's a client build. He mostly plays shooters like Call of Duty and Battlefield 2042. And his favorite overall function and feature is going to be Armory Crate. Of course, your one-stop shop for being able to go tweak, tune, and monitor your system and be able to get things done. Uh, gets a thumbs up for me, man. Hey, Mods by Ben. Happy to have you here, man. Thanks for joining us here on the stream. Um, Mike Russo says it's good looking tough build. 
Uh, nicely put together, uh, like the soft tubing, right? And uh, Mike wraps it up right there with a thanks, guys. So fantastic, man. Uh, that wraps up our PC DIY Builder Spotlight. Um, fantastic. Thank you so much to Brett, and thank you so much for Mike uh, for submitting your guys' build. A little bit light uh, this week, just like I said, because we had more uh, products to be able to wrap up. But next week, we'll definitely get a little bit more uh, into the PC DIY Builder Spotlight uh, for our next stream. As always, guys, if you guys are not part of the Asus PC DIY group, feel free to go ahead and join us there. We've got an amazing community, over 40,000 members. Where we'd like to be ta talk about things all things related to ASUS, all things related to PC DIY, whether it's going to be small form factor builds, water cooled builds, overclocking, undervolting, graphics cards, networking, peripherals, whatever it might be, feel free to go ahead and uh, ask there in the group. It's great space, great space. You can always feel free to tag me as well. And if you're finding out about anything relative to any of our, our products, uh, you can also, of course, check out our featured announcement posts and our new products this week, as well as our product release calendar, which has recently been updated. I know a lot of people, they ask me sometimes, hey, what about this product? product check the product release calendar i try to update it about every two and a half or three weeks and uh, i have updated it but i will be updating it again next week so it should be pretty current as far as uh, products that we have already recently released as well as products that we have uh, announced but will be coming out later all right guys so with that take care take it easy enjoy the rest of your day and have a great weekend Bye bye